Hi, it's Thomas George, and thank you for joining me in this complete Ableton Live 10 course. So what I did is I actually filmed this lecture as one of the latest lectures, so I'm going to give you an overview on screen with me now what you're actually going to learn in this course. We're going to start off with navigating yourself around Ableton Live, so learning what the main functions and features actually do. We're then going to look at editing and recording MIDI and audio, so this includes warping audio. After this, we're going to look at setting up, so things like the preferences, the control bar, the session view, and the arrangement view. Then we're going to look at some of the new features for Live 10, which include the wavetable synth, capture, echo, and the drum bus. Hi, and welcome to this lecture, where we're going to have a look at a quick overview of Ableton Live 10. If you've never used Ableton Live before, this can look quite daunting. You might be thinking, what is going on? Where's my timeline? Why does this not look like Logic Pro or Pro Tools? What are all these little mixing channel things? But I'll explain what they are. If you've used previous versions of Ableton Live, like Ableton Live 9 or maybe even Ableton Live 8, it's very similar, the layout, I'm sure you're used to it. But what this is here, this is called the session view. So this is really great for actually making little clips and adding clips and playing little beats and clips. Then if you hit the tab button, you'll go to something called the arrangement view. So this is more of a kind of a traditional layout, linear, so we have time based, time at the bottom. Then if we hit these buttons here, which actually make up the Ableton logo if you notice, so we have the, the arrangement view and the session view, we can switch back or we can hit the tab button. Mine actually looks a little bit different to yours, I've actually zoomed in quite a lot just for these tutorials really, so you can see what's going on. We can also close sections with these arrows on the side. If you do want to change the size, you can go to Live at the Top Preferences, and then go Look Feel, and you can change the zoom display. I've just zoomed it in so it's easier for people to see what's actually going on. Okay, let's go back to the Session View, hit Tab. So this is the Session View. This is the Arrangement View. If you've used digital audio workstations before, you're probably used to this layout of the Arrangement View. However, the session view, like I said, it can look a little strange. It can look like you're on a mixing desk to start with, but it's not like that. So each one of these has loads of little clips you can actually make, and then we can trigger the clips individually, or we can play a row of clips. So this is really useful for live performance. So you can trigger stuff, and it's also useful for creating a song. You can add loads of little clips, play them, and then what we can do is record it to the arrangement, which we'll look at in a future lecture. So what we can do is actually create our own parts, record them in, or we can just use some of these clips and samples that Ableton Live actually has. So let's just use a few of these samples. I'm just going to type in drums. So these will give us some audio samples. They give us loads of different drums. Then what we can do is just drag them in. Drag this in here. Then let's type in bass. You might notice you just get one hits like this, these can be sampled. So say we want this bass part. We will have to create a new audio track if we want this separate. So let's go create new audio track and then another audio track will appear next to it. Let's just drag the bass here. Then we can go Command R, rename this bass. And now we can play these little clips. So that's this clip, this clip. You'll notice it's actually in time, which is pretty cool. Then we can add the bass. Pause the bass by hitting the square button. Let's get rid of this drum part. Then add the bass. And get rid of this drum part. Add this one. Pause this one. Add this one. And that's kind of really like a really, really, really basic way of using Ableton. Just drag clips in and play them. It's kind of what you do, but you can also make the clips. If you have a MIDI keyboard, you can also play in MIDI information in our instruments. So if you have a MIDI keyboard plugged in, let's just choose this one here, analog. And I play some notes on my MIDI keyboard and I can play along with say this drum part. can even record these clips in. But you do have to make sure your MIDI keyboard's set up and you do have to have this little red light to record arm it. And if we just hide this, 
We have more settings here as well. So we have the MIDI from, so this is where you can choose your MIDI keyboard, the monitor, so you can hear it back or not. So monitor in, monitor auto, monitor off, obviously you won't hear. You can still see the MIDI information with these little yellow dots. We have audio two below this, so this is where the audio goes. We're going to choose master, so it will go to the master channel, so when we play this audio, it will get routed to this master track. Then below this we have sends. So this is where we can actually send part of this to another channel. So we can send it to A, or we can send it to B. So A here is reverb, so we can send it to a reverb unit. If we click, we can bring up reverb, and B is delay. So the more you pump it through, the more you send it, the more it gets sent to this reverb. So I'm just going to play this drum kit. You'll notice it sounds a bit weird, it's because it's got reverb, and B. you notice it sounds a bit strange because it's got a delay. On the left here we have these menus, so we can choose our favourites, we can choose sounds, we can choose drums, instruments, audio effects, MIDI effects, Max for Live, plugins, clips and samples. We will be looking at these in a lot more detail in future lectures. Feel free to skip forward to any lectures, so if you have used Ableton Live 9 before you might want to skip through a few of these beginner ones, but if you're brand new to Ableton Live I definitely recommend watching these. Then we have this little thing here, drop audio effects here, so we can drop audio effects here as it says, and if we click down here, you'll notice we can change to this view, so this view is the sample editor view, and this view is where we can have the effects, so we can have things like the MIDI effects on MIDI channels, and then audio effects on audio channels. The MIDI channels we can have audio effects, but on the audio effects we cannot have any MIDI effects, just audio effects, because the information's already there, it's already been processed, it's already audio, so we can't actually add on a MIDI effect. So we've got all these things here, we have stuff like tempo, metronome, bars, play, recording, it's just a really simple overview, we can hide some certain things here, bring them back. I just wanted to make this lecture just for people who are brand new to Ableton Live, so it's not as scary as it initially looks. So this session view here, this is really where we put in clips and we play clips, and then this part here is where we can kind of change it into more of an arrangement, change it into more of a structured song. We can copy and place clips into this arrangement view. We're going to look at recording again and also building a song in the arrangement view. You'll notice it's kind of faded out. Have this little button here, which will bring it back. So we can just play this drum part if we choose to in the arrangement view. I know some people like to work in the arrangement view, some people like to work in the session view, but I think it's a good idea learning how to use them both. Quick overview, I hope you realise Ableton Live isn't as scary as you first think, because when you first opened it, I remember the first time I opened up Ableton Live, I was very confused for the first couple of weeks really, and after a while you do get used to it, you just have to realise the session view is a place where you collect clips, you bring ideas forward, and the arrangement view is a place normally where you will arrange it into more of a song. So the session view was originally created for live performance really, so people could play these clips live and create more of a, a groove. People do actually use Ableton Live now just for actually recording and creating music. So thank you for watching this lecture, just about getting started in Ableton Live 10. I hope you're starting to get the grips of how it actually works and see each of these as little clips that you can actually record to the arrangement view. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. So thank you for watching this video so far. I hope you're starting to understand the basics of Ableton Live 10. If you want to check out some of the other lectures in this video, then be sure to open up the description below and I have all the different points for the different lectures. So this video course on YouTube is actually just the first part of my complete Ableton Live 10 course. If you'd like to access my full course, which is over 10 hours long, then be sure to check out the description below where you can get this course for only $10. Full price, it is $195. In the complete course, we do cover a lot more things like the simpler, the sampler, the drum racks, the instruments, the MIDI effects, the audio effects, and much more. But anyway, let's continue on with the video. Hi, and welcome to this next lecture. So if you're brand new to Ableton Live, you haven't really used it before, you might be thinking this digital audio workstation, this program looks really complex and difficult to use. It was like that when I first started using Ableton Live. I was a bit overwhelmed because there's so much stuff going on. It's different to other digital audio workstations I've used before like Pro Tools or Logic Pro or Cubase. 
This session view can be a bit daunting, but believe me, it gets a lot easier. But the main thing you need to do is just go in, experiment, and just write some music, really. There's one thing learning all the theory, there's one thing learning what everything does, and there's another thing actually going in and practically doing it. So in this lecture, I'm just going to go through and just quickly make a few loops, make a few grooves. So I want you to go through and do the same afterwards. So it's not about making perfect music straight away. It's not about making the best music ever. It's about getting used to this piece of software so it becomes second nature. So once you understand how it works and you can just go through and make music without thinking about the technical things, without thinking about what stuff does, that's when you know you've mastered Ableton Live. But before you get to that point, you just need to go in and just experiment. Just get some clips down there. Just make some music. So let's actually go ahead and start a new project. So we need to go to File over here and create a new live set. So in Ableton Live, we call them sets rather than projects. And here, open up a blank set. So this set here will have two MIDI tracks and two audio tracks. We also have some reverb and delay and the master channel. So what I'm going to do for now is just use presets. Later on in this course, I will be going through a lot of these different instruments. I'll explain how you can actually use it to create your own sound, but for now, we're just going to use presets because I want you to just start making music, really. Just start getting used to the workflow because it is quite different to other digital audio workstations. So I'm just going to go on instruments. Just use the first one, analog, and let's go down and find mallet. Let's just hear this. Make sure this little headphone button's on. That will do. Let's just click this over, drag it over to MIDI. Okay, so that brings up this instrument. So I've got my MIDI keyboard plugged in. Make sure you've got auto on or monitor or in, because if monitor is on off, you won't hear it. If it's on auto, you obviously will. Okay, now let's go on to drums and let's go on to a drum kit and let's find, let's go on to drum rack below here. Let's just preview some of these. This will do. 606, let's drag this onto MIDI. It might take a moment to load, okay. And now what we need to do is just create some drums. So you'll notice here this drum rack, get these different sounds. And if we click on this blank part here, you can bring up the MIDI editor. If we drag this up, you'll notice it links up to the different drum sounds. So here we have kick, if we hit B, we have a little pencil tool. If we turn on the headphone here, there you go, there's basically just a kick drum loop. So I'm going quite fast, but this is what it's really about, just getting used to it. Here you go, you've got a kick drum. Now we're going to copy this over, hold down Alt or Option, and double click on this, and now I'm gonna add a snare. You look here, snare 606. Get a different snare sound, let's use that one, two and four. Okay, I'm going to color this differently, right click, choose a different color just so I know it's different. Hold down Alt, drag this down, Okay, and now we're gonna add some hi-hats. Let's find hats. Not that one, let's find closed. Okay, that'll do. Okay, just really, really quick, and let's color this different. Okay, that one there. So now we've got some drums. Stop all clips with this square in the bottom right. Now let's add on a bass part. Let's go down to here, make sure this is on. Okay, that one there. Okay, let's hear this back. So all I did is just use the B, just type in some bass notes, and that's really it. I don't really like the sound cloud and bells. It doesn't really sound like a bass part. So let's go back to instruments, let's choose analog, and this time let's open up bass. Let's use the first one, bass floor bounce. Just drag this over to here. And now let's go over to this triangle button and hit play. Okay, we've got a nice little groove going. I'm just gonna close this browser. And then let's hit this button here. Let's play this one. Let's add some hi-hats by pressing this next drum kit. Okay, we're getting the groove going. Okay, I want to add another MIDI instrument. So let's go to Create, Create New MIDI Track. 
So MIDI track, this is my preset, I'm just going to delete this for now. Let's hit this arrow here, and then let's go on to instruments. Now let's choose, let's choose wavetable, that one's very interesting. And let's choose mallets. This one will do. Krockhausen, I think it says. Ableton is a German company, it's probably why it's called Krockhausen. Probably saying that wrong. And let's double click on this, and let's just type in some information. So we've got B. I'm just going to, this is an arpeggio of C minor. C minor 7 with that 7th note, which is a B flat. If you don't know your minor scale, it's the same as a major scale, but you flatten the 3rd, flatten the 6th, flatten the 7th. Or if you're brand new to music theory, just use the white notes, which is C, C major. Okay. Now let's just drag this over, hold down Alt. I'm going to delete the first one, and then bring it in on the second one. Now we're creating more of an arrangement. Let's just go through and use these arrows here. So we've got this going, this groove. And now we're going to bring in the different drum beat and now this synth part. And the next one. Then we can just drag this down and solo this. And then bring it back with kick drum. Copy over this drum part with the snare, and then copy over the bass. Copy over this kick drum. You can always go through and just select different ones here. Just manually click them. Double click on this, I'm just going to change this a little bit more, add a few more notes in. Now when we play it back, it's a few other notes. Just going to colour this, right click, okay, let's do the same with this one, just going to actually Command A, and then hit B, and then hold down Alt drag this down an octave as well. So play octaves. Drag this down, and now right click this. Now I'm going to trigger these clips. Remember we can always go into the effects and change it to a different one. What I'm actually going to do though, is hit create new MIDI track, insert new MIDI track. And then what I'm going to do is find another synth here. This one here, Grotty Bell, drag this over to this MIDI track. This will replace whatever instrument is there. And I'm actually going to just copy some of these over. I'm going to be sneaky and copy some of them that don't really link in. And then hopefully, let's hear what this sounds like. Now this is just a really quick way of just writing in some music. I didn't have any of this planned. It's just about creating layers, creating clips, and that's how you can quickly get in and start making music. I want you to do the same, I want you to spend 10, 15 minutes just going through, playing with ideas, just getting used to the session view, because that's one of the main things about Ableton Live that sets it apart from other digital audio workstations, but also makes it quite difficult to start with. When I first looked at Ableton Live, I was like, whoa, what is this session view? What is going on with these little buttons, these clips? I don't like this, I want to use the arrangement view. However, once I got used to the session view, I realized how powerful it is and how quickly you can just go through and make arrangements and just throw bits in everywhere and just make really interesting music compared to the arrangement view. Don't get me wrong, you can make some great music in the arrangement view, but generally, I prefer using the session view, coming up with loads of great ideas, and then going through the arrangement view, tweaking it, and automating sections. So moving stuff around, and maybe tweaking some of the effects and volumes. So I'm just going to play this now, show you what you can make really quickly, and how easy it actually is.
obviously you can use other chords, you can create stuff that's a bit more experimental, a bit more exciting than that. But for this example, I just thought I'd just go through and show you how you can just quickly go in, drag some MIDI information around to start making music from scratch. Of course, you can use loops as well. You can use samples. Of course, you can use audio. We will be looking at recording audio later on. But let's also just have a look at some of these as well. Let's go on samples. Let's find one of these audio samples. Let's drag this in here as well. Of course we can use this audio sample. You will need to do a few more things like warping, make sure it's in time really. So if you want to have a look at warping audio, be sure to check out the lecture all about warping audio. So I just wanted to show you this lecture because making music in Ableton Live is about making music. It's not always about the preferences. It's not always about setting up and knowing what stuff does. A lot of the time, it's about just jumping in the deep end, making music, experimenting, and learning from trial and error. So I hope you found this useful. Just my workflow of quickly throwing in ideas, and I hope you practice doing the same thing. I hope you just go in, start making music, start making loops, and then continue the lectures. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi and welcome to this lecture where we're going to be looking at editing in the arrangement view. So I just made this little groove in the session view and then I actually recorded this into the arrangement view by just playing through the clips and hitting the record button. Now it's in the arrangement view, let's just have a quick listen to this and then we're going to go through and edit in the arrangement view. It's just really a simple groove and then I have a few variations of the drum kit and a variation of the bass line and then I add this synthesizer part. That's kind of the groove, just a really simple pattern I made quickly for this tutorial. Okay, so the first thing we could do is actually create a bit of space. So when the kick drum plays, it doesn't get too muddy. The lower frequencies don't get too muddy. So one thing we can do is create a bit of space. So when the uh, kick drum is playing, the bass line will duck down a little bit. We can do this with sidechain compression. If you want to know more about sidechain compression, I recommend checking out the lecture on sidechain compression. But the good thing is you can add on effects in the arrangement view, not just in the session view. So if we go over to this arrow and go to audio effects, let's go to compressor and we could drag this onto, say, the bass part. Then we can just add sidechain, input from drum rack, and then choose kick. And now we play it. We create a bit more space in the mix. That's one little tip you can do. Okay, now let's have a look at adding some automation. So one of the best things about Ableton Live is this automation setting in the arrangement view. So all you need to do is click on what you want to automate. I'm going to choose this filter frequency cutoff in this bass synth. So click on this. Make sure this automation button is armed up here. And then it just appears. So the last thing you clicked on will actually appear in the automation. I click resonance and you can see up here it changed to resonance. So let's choose filter frequency and we can actually just draw in parts here, just click and drag up. So I'm just going to increase the filter frequency here and let's click on resonance and here I'm going to actually increase the resonance like so. Okay, let's hear this part now. <laughs> So you can go back to frequency. Whatever's well, red is the one that has automation as well. Go back to resonance. That might be a little bit too dramatic, but it is really interesting just clicking down here. The ones that are red are the ones that have automation. Let's just drag it down a little bit. Okay, and let's say we want to just automate the volume, keep it nice and simple. We can click on volume here and then just gradually fade the volume down. Now let's hear this and you should hear a fade in the volume of the bass synth part. We 
can also do the same with sends. Say we want to actually add some reverb, we can automate this as well. So I've just clicked on this button here, which is the send. So we have the return track A, return track B. So we can send to return track A and return track B. But I only want to actually uh, add reverb at the end. So I'm just going to automate some reverb for this bass part as well. And let's hear this back. So the volume should go down. So if we look, the master volume of the synth, and then if we go on mixer, the reverb will increase. So we will increase this reverb, or we'll send the track to the reverb unit, and we'll also decrease the volume. So let's hear this bit now. <laughs> do a similar kind of thing with a synthesizer. Let's just click on here. So this will send to return track A, which is this one here, which has a reverb unit. So all you need to do is click on this and then just add on some reverb here as well, increase. And let's do a similar kind of thing. Let's go on, let's click on this track and go on volume and we're just going to automate the volume down a little bit. So let's hear this. So this riff here, this synth part, the lead part, it should increase in reverb and decrease in volume. Okay. You could add a fade as well for the drums, just gradually fade it down. So there's loads of things we can do in the arrangement view. It just makes it really interesting to write music in the session view, record it into the arrangement view, and then go through and find, tweak, and tune, and automate parts in the arrangement view. Like I said, you can go back to this window here, and you can add audio effects in the arrangement view. It's the same as the session view, so don't just always rely on the session view. The arrangement view is very useful, especially for mixing, arranging, tweaking, and editing your audio and your MIDI in Ableton Live 10. So that's how you can automate, and that's how you can edit using the arrangement view. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, in this lecture, I'm going to quickly make a song in the session view and I'll explain my process along the way. So if you're new to Ableton Live and you just want to jump in and start making music, I definitely recommend watching this lecture. So we're going to start off with some drums. So let's go over to Drum Rack. And I've got a few presets here, but let's actually start off, and I'll just delete my presets. I'm going to start off with some blank ones. So here we go. If you want more detail about the drum rack, I recommend checking out the section on the drum rack. But for now, we're just going to drag in samples, and this will link up with our MIDI keyboard. So let's go on samples, and I'm going to type in kick. Let's get this kick, drag it to C1. Now I'm going to type in snare. Get this one here, have this on D1, and now I'm going to type in hats. This one here, let's have this on F sharp one, and let's find another hat. This one here, let's have this on G sharp. Okay, we've got really simple drums here. Okay, and then I'm going to double click on here. This will open up some MIDI information, and you'll notice that the drums have appeared on the side. Now I'm going to hit B, and this will bring up the pencil tool. I'm going to type in some drums. Notice that that one wasn't on the beat. I want that off the beat. And snare, I'm going to have two, four, and hats. I'm going to make a little pattern here. Just type in some hats. Zoom in, the zoom here, and if we zoom in, we can look at this in more detail. I'm just going to have another hat here. So there is the drum part. Okay. Drag this down and let's just play that back. Really simple. Okay. Now I'm going to add in a bass part. Let's do this with MIDI. So I'm going to go on instruments, get rid of this search here where it says hats. Okay. I'm going to choose analog. I'm going to use a preset bass. This one here. Drag this over to MIDI. Okay, and now we're going to type in some bass. Remember, the drums was playing, let's have a look at the drums, it was playing kick, kick, that weird beat there, so a bit early, and then kick. So let's make a bit of space, actually. Okay, here we have a lot more options, but I'm just going to keep this in C minor. 
Okay, and then go up to uh, E flat. Okay, and then go down to a B flat. This is all in C minor. And drag this out a bit because I want this a bit longer than just one bar. Let's have it. Let's just have it two bars for this example. Okay, so I'm going to hit B, drag all this over, and then just copy and paste it, or hold down Alt. So remember it went to C here. If we hit this headphones, we can actually hear what's going on in here. Move this to an F. Okay, move this down to a C, and then this one can go to a G. Okay, let's hear this back. To play both of these clips at the same time, we will have to hit this arrow button here. Okay, starting to get a groove. I don't like the last note, so let's change the last note to something else. Let's hear it back now. Okay, getting a bit of a groove. So it's kind of a C minor, and then we go to a F. It's kind of a, a C slash F, so it's a C minor still, but of F in the bass. So we can just really just play a C minor chord, and it fit over all of this. So I'm going to copy this, hit Command C, then Command V. Let's copy this track over. Okay, I'm going to actually choose a different preset. Let's go on Analog again. This time I'm going to choose... Let's choose synth keys, okay? Maybe not them, you can audition these sounds, make sure the headphone icon is on here. Sometimes the sounds might not be suitable. This one here, drag this over and it will replace. Okay, now we've got the MIDI information from the bass, so we know what to work with, which is quite interesting. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, hit Command A, hit Shift and up, and that moves everything up an octave. So what we can do is I'm going to add a harmony of an octave and a fifth. So I'm going to select Alt, drag it up. Okay, and then I'm going to drag each one up. I'm going to make a harmony of an octave and a third. So let's drag this up, a minor third. So in C minor it's that one. It's actually an E flat button here, it comes up as sharps. So you'll notice that flats actually come up as sharps. So we've got this one here, which is a D sharp or E flat, and a third is this major third, a G. This one is an A flat. So up an octave. And up a third is a major third, which is a D. And then we have an F, up a minor third, which is a G sharp or A flat. And then we have this one, which is a C up to a D sharp and D sharp again. So now we've got a bit of a harmony going, playing the bass line up an octave and another octave with a third. So we've got more of a riff going now. We've got the bass line and we've got a riff. So what we could do, which is a thing that I like to do, is now go back to the bass and add a bit more rhythm. So this is more of a riff now. So we can add a few more notes. So I'm going to have a bit more movement in this part. Just going to copy this over, this rhythm. Okay, and now I have a bit more rhythm and a bit more movement, so let's hear this. Could even make it a bit straighter if we wish. So at the moment it is quite syncopated, it depends on what you're after, so I'm just going to move a few of these so like this. This one back. This clashes with the kick drum, so I'm moving it. Up an octave. So let's find out where that was. I got that wrong, that wasn't a C. When making music, it's not always going to be perfect. So that was actually a B flat. That's where we heard that clash sound because it wasn't the correct note. 
drag this back. So this is just a lecture really to show you how you can quickly make loops and patterns in the session view. Okay, so that's really how we can build up layers. And then say we want another bass part, we can just hit down Alt, drag this down. And now we can click on this. And maybe we just want one note going along, just one note consistently. So what we could do is drag all these down to C. So we've got the same pattern, but just one note. Add a bit of variation into our parts. Okay, so it's a C, it all fit over C. It's a very simple part. We can right click this and color it differently. And now when I play, we can go to the other part. And go back again by clicking here. One thing is, make sure you're not in the red. Peaking's not very good. It can ruin your sound. So just drop some of this down a bit. And now we're not peaking. And let's go to the other bass part. We could do a similar kind of thing with this synth part here. We can hold down Alt, drag it down. I'm going to use the same trick. Just going to move this all down to C. We do need to turn this into a minor. So there we go, this one as well. So we're moving it all to C and E flat, or D sharp as it says in Ableton Live. You can do a lot of this by ear, or you can look at the notes on the side. Okay, now when we play back, we'll have this part. Let's colour this again. I can add the other part. And go back to the other one by clicking. Okay, and now we're going to change some of these drums around. So we've got that main drum kit. I'm going to hold down Alt, drag it down, click on here. And now I'm going to take out all these snares, just these two snares. Okay, and then going to right click, let's colour this different, just so I know it's a different part. Drag down, double click, and now let's get rid of the snares and the hi-hats. So we've just got that kick. Colour this, right click, different colour, and now let's do one more where it's just the snares and the hi-hats. So we need to actually drag this first one because we want the hi-hats and the snares. Double click on this. So I'm basically just get rid of the kicks. Okay, and now we've Got a bit of an arrangement going here. So let's start off actually with just the kicks, which is this first one. So let's drag all this down. Or we can hit Command and I, which will start, which will add in a new section here. So we're going to start with just this here, just the kick and the bass. We'll drag these sends over to the side. Okay, but we're going to start with this bass, so it's just the one note, and then build up with this one with the other note. And then we're going to add in the other synth part, so the part with more movement, if you see here. But we're going to keep this one note bass going. And then we're going to add in this bass with more notes, but we're actually going to uh, swap the synth to the part with uh, just one note. And then we're going to add in the part with all the notes, and we're going to add in the bass with all the notes. And then we're going to find the kick. And then when this comes in here, and then we're going to add in the full drum kit, which is this one here, this blue one. So let's... And then when this kicks in, this purple bit, we're going to add in this blue bit with all the drums kicking in. And here we need to just colour this differently so now it's a different part. This is basically just a very, very, very fast arrangement. And I'm just going to do this. Add the drums in again, and go back to the original part. Go back to just the kick. And then go back to just that synth part. And then finish. Like so. So that's a very, very quick arrangement. You might not be able to do this as quick if you've just started. But this is just a way of showing you how you can quickly get clips together. Because the main thing I struggled with Ableton Live is getting used to this clip view. Getting used to actually making music in clips. So that's a very quick way of how you can do it in MIDI information and using samples. So now we just need to play through these arrows here and then just feel the beat, feel when to change. And I'm going to play a quick arrangement in now. I think that starts a little bit too abrupt. So hit Command and I. Add in a new section here, so drag this down. And just start with the bass and the drums. And then I'm actually going to... Uh, Add in a new section here. 
and just drag this down and then bring the drums back again into here. This colour grey isn't really the best because it's quite hard to see what's actually going on. I'm just going to uh, select all of these grey ones, hold down the command button and then just choose another colour. There we go, now we can see what's going on. That one there got away, so let's select that as well. It's a different blue, it's not the correct one because there's so many different tones here, sometimes you can get it wrong. But all I really need to know is how to actually see the difference. And there's a little sneaky trick we can do now, is we just hit record at the same time and this will actually record into the arrangement. Now hit play. And if we hit the tab button, you can see it's recording into the arrangement. Okay, and now I'm going to hit this play button here, and this will trigger the next row of clips. Ready? Ready? And now... One mistake I want to change there is I want it to change every four bars not every one bar, because I want to have this as kind of a four bar phrase, so I can make some changes really quickly and it won't change straight away. So here you'll notice we have all this information, I'm going to hit this button and just delete it all, drag it and delete, and then go back and re-record. So remember all you need to do is hit this record button and then trigger your clips. So now it's going to change every four bars rather than every bar. Ready? You can make changes on the fly while we're recording, which is pretty cool. Like there, I just deleted that part. And now let's trigger in the next part. To delete the space part. Now I've got a new section. Ready? And now the new part. And now all together. We can always go back actually, we don't have to go down in a linear fashion, so we're going to go back to the start. And now, so it doesn't have to be going down in order, we can go back and forth however we want, which is really interesting. So for live performance, or if you just decide you want something different whilst you're recording, you can just quickly bang this in. So I'm going to go back to this part here. And now this orange part here. And now I'm going to go down. And let's skip to here. We could even stop this part here, hit this square button, this will stop this drum clip. There, I can add the drums back in. Ready? Now I'm going to add this bass part in. Now we're going to change the drums. Now we're going to build up. Let's change these simps. Ready? One, two, three, four. Now let's add this other bass part in. Now let's take the drums out. Let's change the bass part. Now we're going to change the drum part and the synth part. Now I'm going to soak out the bass. Now I'm going to soak out the drums. 
Now I'm going to stop the synths. We can fade down as well. Okay, and then hit stop. And there we go, that's how you can really quickly make a song in Ableton Live. If I hit the tab button now, and hit this little triangle here, this has actually recorded all of this, what I just did, into the arrangement view, which is absolutely fantastic in my opinion. You can just record something in on the fly, make a quick arrangement, and Ableton Live has recorded it in. That was over three, three minutes that recorded the whole bit in. So if I just play back now, there we go, we've got the drums, the synths, we've got the bass. And we can always go in here and change stuff around. So you might notice right at the end, I drop the volume on the synthesizer. So let's hear this at the end. You can see there that the volume actually changed. So we can actually go in and automate this volume and change around in the arrangement view, which we'll be looking at later on. But that's how you do it. That's how you can quickly make a song in Ableton Live. Would that take about 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes? And that was a full song. Maybe not the best song, but it's a good example of how you can just quickly put in ideas, but this could build into something good. There's some nice ideas there. And you could always go back to the session view, re-record this in if you wanted to, delete what you just did in the arrangement view, or maybe save as, and save this as a different copy, file, save as, then just quickly make music. So I wanted to just film this lecture just to show you how easily and how quickly you can make music in Ableton Live 10. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, now we're going to have a look at the MIDI editor. So let's first of all create a MIDI clip. So in our MIDI instrument here, I've just dragged in an analog preset. And then all we need to do is just double click on this blank slot and this will open up the MIDI editor. We can resize the MIDI editor by dragging up. And we can actually go back to the device view by clicking the button here. Or we can use the key command shift and tab and that will toggle between the MIDI editor and the device view. So we have a few different things going on here in the MIDI editor. We have the bar numbers at the top, and then to the left we have the piano roll. So we have the notes of the piano. If you'd like to hear some of these notes as you click them, make sure you have this little headphone icon enabled. Let's just draw in some notes now. To do this, we need to activate the pencil tool. We can hit the pencil tool button up here, or we can just press B on our keyboard, and that will bring up the pencil tool. So I'm just going to type in a few notes. Okay, and you'll notice down here that we have some velocity. So it goes from 1 to 127. 127 is maximum velocity, and 1 is minimum velocity. 0 will be off or no velocity. So we can edit the velocity of the pencil tool, or we can hit B again, and we can just drag down the velocity of these instruments with this little circle on the end of this line. We can also zoom in or zoom out by scrolling up to the top here. You'll notice there's a magnifying glass. So you can click and drag down to zoom in, or click and drag up to zoom out. You can also use the buttons plus and minus on your keyboard to zoom in or zoom out. We can also click on the notes and drag them around, or we can change their length. We can select them all by hitting Command A, and drag them all around. We can drag them up or down an octave by hitting Shift and Up arrow for up an octave, or Shift and Down for down an octave. So this allows us to quickly change octaves of our notes. In the top left, we have the fold button. And what this will do, it will only actually display the notes that we are using. This is most useful for drums. For example, if you're using a drum kit and you just have, say, a kick, a snare, a hi-hat, and a crash cymbal, you don't really want all the notes of the piano roll because that can get a bit confusing. You will just really want the notes that you are using. However, if you're playing a more harmonic instrument like a piano, you probably will want Fold deselected and you will want to see all of the notes. If you're on a Mac, you can use the key command, Command and Alt, and this will create this hand icon which allows you to scroll up quickly. If you're on a PC, it will be Control and Alt. 
Okay, if you move your cursor upwards, you'll notice that a speaker sign will appear. So when you click now, obviously spacebar to pause and spacebar to play the clip as well. Going back to the pencil tool, if we draw in a note or several notes, you'll notice it will snap to the grid. We can undo this by hitting Command and Z as well. So we can change the grid amount. If we right click, you'll notice we can go down to Fix Grid. At the moment it's set to 1 16th notes, but we can change it to Adaptive Grid. So Adaptive Grid will give us more lines as we zoom in. So let's try Adaptive Grid. Now you'll notice there's a lot less lines, but as we zoom in, more lines will actually appear. As we zoom out, you'll notice it's a lot tighter than it was before. So if you want to make some really intricate parts that aren't necessarily set to a beat division, Adaptive Grid can be very useful. We can change it back to a fixed grid by right clicking and going back to Fixed Grid. We can zoom out again with this magnifying glass. Then we have the loop markers up here. The top one is the loop and the bottom one is the start point and on the right is the end point. So we could have the loop starting here, but the actual loop could just be this part here. So let's just play this loop now, and you'll notice when I play it, it will start here, and it will loop around this section. So that's basically the MIDI editor. It's a quick overview of how you can start to edit your own MIDI information in Ableton Live 10. So thank you for watching, I hope you found this useful, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi and welcome to this lecture, where we're going to look at setting up a microphone and recording audio. So I do recommend using headphones if you're going to record audio. And it's actually quite straightforward in Ableton Live. So in the session view, you have audio tracks up here. To create a new audio track, you can use the key command, Command T. Or uh, go over to Create, Insert, Audio Track. On the PC, it will be Control T. And here will be some audio tracks. You do get two audio tracks as the defaults. And if we click on here, you'll notice we get all these settings. So we have audio from, audio to. For now, let's leave audio to to master. So this track will get sent over to the master track. And audio from, you will have to select your audio interface and your microphone. So if you have an audio interface, you can select it here. If you don't have an audio interface, you can use the built-in mic on your computer, but that's not generally very good. So I do recommend getting a microphone and an audio interface. What type of microphone you want really does depend on what you want to record. But for now, let's just select on here and let's choose external in. You can see here I've got a microphone coming through and this is just on one channel, so I'm going to select one. If you don't have your microphone coming through here, you will have to go onto the preferences. So go onto live, the top left, go down to preferences, and then go on audio. And here we'll have the input device, which is my audio interface, which is called Shure Digital. And the output device, I'm using the built-in output. You don't have to use the same output as input. And here you can see this grey line appear. So when I make sound into the microphone, you can see it's appearing this grey line. If we have monitor in, then we will hear this. It's actually a separate microphone to the one I'm speaking in now. So if I talk in this microphone here, you can hear obviously the audio and you can see it with this green line here. I recommend just having it on auto and then we can record in some audio. In the session view, it's really straightforward. All we need to do is hit this little circle here and make sure the track is armed by selecting this button here down here so it gets changed to red. I do recommend having the metronome on if you want to record in time. So just select this metronome button up here. And then all we need to do is just select one of these little circles. I've got a small shaker, so I'm just going to record in a shaker. And hit the stop button. Okay, then I'm just going to take the first bar of this. 
So I can just drag this back to here, and then when I play this back, it's going to loop round and round. Okay, later on we will look at actually warping this audio, so making this go in time, kind of quantizing the audio, so it's actually in time. And it's really straightforward to do in the arrangement view as well. All we need to do is hit the tab button, or hit this button up here, to go to the arrangement view. It's very similar, all we need to do is just make sure external in is selected here, and then choose input. It depends on what input you're plugged into on your audio interface, I'm going to select one. For monitor, I'm going to have it on auto. If you don't want to hear this back, you could have it on off. And the audio, I want this to get sent to the master, so hit master. Make sure this red dot is selected here, and then just select and hit record. I've got a two bar counting, then recording some audio. Okay, we can see the audio here. If we play it back, we can hear the audio. Same kind of thing, we can drag the length, we can change it around here, but we will look at warping in a later lecture. So that's basically a quick way of recording audio in Ableton Live. If we want to go back to the session view, just hit tab, then we can hear this here. And we can also go over to the arrangement view, hit this little triangle button over here, and this will play the audio from the arrangement view. So that's how you can record audio in Ableton Live, and that's how you can set up a microphone. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you for watching this video so far. I hope you find it useful. If you'd like to continue learning after this course, then be sure to check out my complete Ableton Live 10 course, which is over 10 hours long. You can get this course for only $10 if you check out the coupon in the description below. I also offer over at digitalmusicmasters.com an academy and a mentorship program if you'd like to learn even more with me after this video. So let's continue, we've got a lot more to learn and thank you again for sticking with me and I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, now let's have a look at warping the audio. So warping really allows us to put this audio in time. So when we're playing in audio, we're not always going to play it in perfectly. If you're recording, say, jazz music, maybe you might want a bit of swing, you might want some human elements to it. But for a lot of electronic music, you might really want it warped and you might really want it perfectly in time. So all we need to do is click on our audio track, our little clip here, and then we can zoom in with this uh, magnifying glass here. And we can loop it by hitting this loop button. So it'll loop round and round, and we have the start point of the loop, the end point of the loop, and above here we have the loop markers. So first thing we need to do is make sure warp is selected. If warp isn't selected, we would just have a clip like this, with no dots or anything above or below, just a time scale. And if we select warp, you'll notice we have these little dots here. So what we can actually do is we can go in and drag these around and move the audio. So it preserves, if we double click, it will create these little yellow dots and this will preserve the audio. So if I move this one around, you'll notice before and after is not affected. Depending on how well you actually played this part in, is how close it will be to the bars or to the beats. So let's just drag this in. I was playing 16th notes. So let's just fix this and just click in and try and make this perfectly in time. So I believe it was just like this. So it's quite a simple pattern. And say for example there, I want it to warp from here. I can just double click and move this marker. Ableton generally does a pretty good job, but sometimes it's not always correct. So just double click and move it in place. And that's the best way really to uh, warp it in. And I think that's right. Let's have a listen. Let's just play it back and it should loop round and round. Make sure loop is selected. Some weird double time thing going on there. So I didn't quite get that right. I could either go in and correct that. But for now, for this example, I'm just going to use this first section. So there we go, we've got the loop, it's in time. If I put the metronome on, we can check. You can always go in and correct a few more things as well. I don't really like that first one, it's cut off, if you look. So we could always start from a different loop point. So we could start from, say, here. 
we could always drag this first one forward. Get a bit of a shuffle going. So it's not completely in time, so I'm just going to shuffle this beat around. So it's not bang on the beat, which could be interesting. But you do have to go in and correct it, really. It can take a bit of time, but that's really how you can warp. You can do it manually by dragging around. Say I want it to start from here. I don't want the rest of this. I just want this to start. I can right-click and go on set 1.1.1 from here, and that sets one from there. You can also right-click and crop sample, and this will crop the rest of the sample. So we've just got this little section now. We have the segment BPM, so this will allow the little segment, so we can drag it around like this. And then we can double time it or half time it with these here. So you'll notice this will go a lot faster. Or you can half time it, even slower. So we can get some interesting sounds here. So below this as well, we have the warp type. So we have beats. So if you've got a beat like this with a lot of transients, I do recommend using beats. Then you have tones if you have a different type of sound, probably not for drums, texture, repitch, complex, and complex pro. Complex and complex pro will be the most accurate ones, but they will use up the most CPU. I do recommend going through all of these and having a listen. You can really hear the difference when you slow it down. So let's slow this right down. This is texture. Let's go to tones. So tones will try and preserve the tones a bit more. Repitch, which will obviously uh, slow the pitch down like a record because the other ones will actually preserve the pitch. The repitch will play its more natural pitch. We've got complex. Let's try complex. And then we've got complex pro. We have a few more controls for complex pro. We can choose the formants and also the envelope. So with warp mode, we can really create some unique sounds we wouldn't normally think of. That little shaker has been turned into something a lot more experimental now. Especially at the end, we could even just loop the end bit if we wanted to. Of course, we could also transpose this with the transpose button. So this has actually turned into an effect more than a drum shaker now. We can change the volume here with the decibels. and detune it if we wish. Then there's a few more options in the clip. So we can actually go in and change some of the envelopes. So this is a volume envelope for the clip. We can select transposition modulation, grain size, a few other ones. If you just want to get started warping, I recommend having a look at this warp feature because it can allow you to create some really interesting sounds. We have trigger mode as well, but this is more for live performance, which we'll be looking at later on. But for now, if you want to warp audio, just jump in, double click on the audio, move these little uh, orange parts around, and then uh, yeah, experiment and just try and get it in time. So thank you for watching this lecture, just about warping in Ableton Live 10. Hi, in this lecture, we're going to look at the main preferences in Ableton Live 10. So these are the preferences to get you up and running and to start making music. So to go to preferences, you click on live and then go on preferences. For a PC, I believe it's under options. And here we have a few different settings on the side here. So look, feel, here we can choose our language. And here we can zoom the display in. I currently have the display zoomed in. You can either zoom this out and it will fit to size as well. So I'd like to have 150 per personally. That's just me though, because I do create uh, lectures, so it is easier if it's zoomed in a bit more. Okay, going down, we do have theme. So we can choose different themes. We have light. Dark, Live 9. So the default is mid-light, but go through 
and choose the ones. I quite like dark, but it really doesn't matter too much. It just depends on what you're used to. Then we have the brightness, if you want to make it brighter or not. Double click to go back to the default. Color intensity, uh, the hue as well. So we can change it with the hue. It can get a little too, yeah, a bit too much. So I'm just going to bring it back to the default. Okay, going down, we have audio. So the default for Max is the core audio. And here we have input devices, so for audio input. So this is for your audio interface. If you want to record any audio, such as a microphone or say a guitar, then if you click on this, your audio interface should appear here. Mine's a Scarlett 2i2. And the same with the output, you could have it appear here as well. If you're just making music with MIDI or just on your laptop with no microphones, you don't actually need an audio interface to do this. You can select built-in input and built-in output. And then we have sample rates, 44,100 or 48,000 are both fine. Then we have buffer size. The lower we go, the less latency we might get. If your computer is struggling, maybe increase your buffer size, but the default one is absolutely fine. And then we have test tone. This is just to test that your speakers are working, really, and your output's working. You can change the tone, you can change the volume. Okay, and going along, we have Link MIDI. So if you have a MIDI device, a MIDI keyboard, or say a MIDI controller, like a Posh 2, it will appear here. At the moment, I've just got my MIDI keyboard plugged in, which is this Oxygen 25. And here we have Track and Remote turned on. So Track basically means we can play notes on the keyboard, and Remote means we can actually sync this to certain devices or knobs in Ableton Live. So for example, you want to MIDI map something to a knob on your controller or a dial, make sure remote is also turned on. For now though, we don't need output turned on. You can leave this on off. If your controller does not appear automatically down here, which it normally will, you can find it in this drop down box here where it has most of the compatible controllers that are used in Ableton Live. Okay, going down, we have File Folder. So here in Plugin Sources, this is where you can rescan your plugins. So if you have any external plugins, say for example, any external keyboards or any plugins by companies such as Waves or Native Instruments or anyone like that that have third-party synthesizers or plugins, you can rescan them here. These are plugins though that are not included in Ableton Live. They're from other manufacturers. A lot of the time they are paid plugins as well. And if you are using a Mac, you will get audio units. If you're using a PC, it'd be VSTs. But Mac actually does allow you to have VSTs and AUs, audio units as well. Okay, going down we have a library. I wouldn't really worry about this too much. Then we have record, warp, so you can choose a file type. So you could have AIFF or WAV. Eva is absolutely fine. Bit depth, 24 is fine. Counting, I do like to have two bars of counting or eight clicks. So when you record, you've got a bit of time to prepare yourself ready to play. Okay, going down, we have warp mode. So you can choose your default warp mode. There is a lecture about warping in this tutorial series. So if you do want to learn more about warping, make sure you have a look at that lecture. But beats is fine. And this one's quite important, create fades on clip edges. So this is basically to stop the pop sounds at the end of clips. It will create crossfades, so it'll just get rid of some of the popping sounds. We have launch mode as well down here. I wouldn't worry about this too much if you're brand new to Ableton Live. And then going down, we have licenses, where you can have a look at your Ableton license. So this is just a quick run through of the preferences because I know sometimes when you open up a digital audio workstation, when you're brand new to it, you don't want to go through all the preferences. You just want to jump in and start making music straight away. So I thought I'd just give you a quick rundown so you can go in and just set this up as soon as possible so you can start making your music. I'd give you another run through. So you have the look feel, you can have the zoom display, you can have the theme. Audio, this is where you set up your audio interface. You have your sample rate and your buffer size. Then Link MIDI, this is where you can set up your external MIDI controllers or MIDI devices. File folder, this is where you can scan for your audio units or VSTs, your third-party plugins or synthesizers. Library, I wouldn't worry about that too much right now. Warp mode, here you can choose your file type and 
your warp mode, and that's basically it. So I hope you find this lecture. So I hope you found this lecture useful, just so you can just understand the preferences quickly. Go in and start making music. Hello and welcome to this lecture, where we're going to be talking about packs. So in Ableton Live, we have a lot of different packs available to us. So if we go to the clip mode here, you notice we've got a lot of different clips and samples. I've also got a lot of different samples. These are not all included with Ableton Live. However, you will have to download these and not all of them are free. I have been using Ableton Live for a while and have built up a collection of packs. You don't need them all though. You can make some great music without all of these packs. But if you do want to follow along and use the exact same packs I use, you can use this by going to the Ableton site and then just click on packs. So here there's a lot of different packs. There's 189 different ones. I don't have all of these, but I do have quite a few. To access the packs, you have to go on user, select your user accounts, and then go down to music, and then go down to Ableton, and then go down to factory packs. So this is where the packs are kept if you download these. And there is another way to view your packs as well. If you're not using a Mac, if you're using a PC, I recommend using this way of finding your packs. So go up to Live in the top left, go to Preferences, and then go to Library. And here it says Location of User Library. And it's the exact location I just said, User, Thomas George, Music, Ableton, User Library. It might be slightly different if it's on a PC, but you can click on this Browse button and this will actually allow you to choose a directory for your user library. And below it says Installation Folder for Packs. And here, same again, you can choose Installation Directory for Factory Packs. So this is where the packs are. You can change these to a different location if you wish. And remember, just go to the Ableton site to download the packs. Like I said, not all of these packs are free. Some of them may cost a bit of money. It really depends on how seriously you want to take this. If you want to produce full time, if you want to take music production seriously, I do recommend paying for a few of the packs. But maybe just start off with the free ones. There is a section here, free. And really just go down and download all of the packs I recommend. You can get some great stuff here. But however, like I said, you might have to pay for some of these. You can get software instruments as well. But some of them, like the Wavetable Synth, is included in Live Suite. And other ones, like the Sampler or the Operator or Amp, you can just download. And that's basically it. That's how you can access the packs. You can also choose it by genre. So if you click on All and Genre Instruments, you could choose, say, Dubstep. And then there's loads of different ones here. I don't have all of these. I've got a few of them. And if you do want to use the exact same packs I've got, just have a look at the PDF download that is included with this lecture. And here will be all of the packs that I'll be using. Like I said, I do actually have quite a few. These are some of the packs here. Um, but yeah, if you want to get the exact same ones, I recommend just download or just have a look at the PDF that's included with this lecture. And then you can use the exact same packs as me if you wish. Some of them though, like I said, aren't free, for example, orchestral brass, if we just type this into the pack search. So if we go on all, I've just opened this in the incognito window and you notice the brass is actually 129 euros. So yeah, some of them aren't that cheap really. Um, however, it can be useful, but it really depends on how serious you want to take this. You can follow along with all of these lectures without having the exact same packs. I just pick some of them by random a lot of the time and I've got so many packs that I do uh, lose track of which ones are free and which ones are paid. However, don't worry if you don't have the paid packs because you can still make fantastic music with just the free ones. So thank you for watching this lecture. Just about accessing the packs, remember just go to the Ableton site and if you want to find a location just go up to preferences on Ableton Live and then just go on library and here you can actually choose a location for the pack. So thank you for watching this lecture. If you've got any questions about packs, feel free to start a discussion. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Hi, in this lecture, we're going to look at the session view. So the session view is this view here. In Ableton Live, we have two views. We have the session view 
and of course we have the arrangement view. We can swap between these by hitting the tab view. But in this lecture, we're going to look at the session view. So Ableton Live is unique because it actually offers these two views, the session view and the arrangement view. So you can use one of these workflows exclusively. So you can use the session view or the arrangement view, or you can use them both together. So you can either hit tab to go between these two views or go over to the section on the right here. The horizontal lines will be the arrangement view and the vertical lines will be the session view. This is where the Ableton logo is actually built from, this session view and arrangement view. However, when you move to the different views, arrangement view and session view, you'll notice the edges. So this side here and this side here actually do stay the same. So the session view, like I said, is pretty unique to Ableton Live. It's similar to a mixer, but it allows us to actually add clips and create music on the fly quickly and make really fast arrangements. The arrangement view is similar to other digital audio workstations like Logic Pro or Pro Tools. And also in the arrangement view, it moves on a time scale. So from left to right is time and up or down is the instrument. So you'll notice at the top you have the bars, and then at the bottom here you have the time in seconds, and then in minutes. So we can create these little boxes here by double clicking, and this will create on a MIDI track some MIDI information. And so we can create several little boxes. At the moment this information is blank, and the audio tracks we can't double click to add information. We'll have to either record in audio, or drag in audio samples. But on the MIDI information, we can just quickly draw in some information just by using this pencil button by hitting B or hitting B again to get rid of it. And we can hit backspace or right click and delete these boxes. These boxes are little clips of information. So this can contain MIDI information and we can process this MIDI information through an instrument to create a drum beat, a synthesizer, sound effect. So you can quickly throw in bits of information. If you're new to Ableton Live, this session view can look quite confusing. You're probably used to this arrangement view. The session view, however, once you get used to it, allows you to quickly create music and you can make some really interesting stuff. So most of these clips are normally four bars or eight bars. It could even be two bars, one bars. You can choose the length you want them to be. And let's actually just get a sample. You'll notice down here, if you click on samples, you'll have a few different samples that you can use. So a lot of these are one-shot samples or sound effects, the so things like kick drums, snares, guitar sounds, or we can actually go to clips, which will play more loops rather than sound effects or one-shot hits. So we can click to preview these. And if we have this little headphone icon on, we can see some of these samples. Here is a loop. We can double click on this, and this will open as actually a MIDI effect, because this opens in something called a drum rack. If you're new to drum racks, don't worry, I do cover the drum rack extensively in this tutorial series. So we have loads of different things here, we can drag them on. So we can actually drag this below, we can have another clip using the same drum rack. And then we can press the play button. We can actually go between these different drum racks. However, going down vertically, you can't have two clips playing at the same time. Going along though, you can have different clips playing at the same time. So if you just drag this over here, you'll notice it won't actually play anything there's MIDI information coming through this, but the MIDI information has to process through an instrument to actually create some sound. So if we go over to instrument, we have categories. We could drag on the instrument, say, a operator synth. If we click this little arrow here, we get some presets. So we can click on, say, guitar and plucked and drag this into the MIDI information. It'll sound awful because this is designed for a drum rack. So if it's designed for drums, you'll notice if you double click on this, it will bring up some MIDI information. And this isn't really for a keyboard sound, this is for drums. So this is drum hits and hi-hats and stuff like that. So be, so be careful when you're loading MIDI information that you get it for the right kind of instrument. However, if we click on say drum rack here, and let's choose 
one of these presets here that I've actually made. You can drag this over, and now when we play this, it's clipping, make sure your clips don't go too loud. We drop the volume down. Starting to sound more like a drum kit. This is quite a heavy trap sound drum kit, so maybe this might not be the right sound. But it really does depend on what kind of sound you're after. Okay, we can delete these tracks here by hitting backspace or even right clicking and going to delete until we're left with one track and we can create a new track by going up to create and insert audio track or use the key command command T or insert MIDI track by using the key command shift command T. This will open a new MIDI track. You can have presets set on your MIDI track. The one I have has a synthesizer called Serum. That is not included with Ableton Live. So let's just have a look at that quickly. Serum is a plugin. So if you click on plugins, you'll have your different plugins here. These are from different third party manufacturers that are not included with Ableton Live. So it might be things like the Waves plugin, it might be stuff like the UAD plugins, it could be synthesizers like Serum or Native Instruments Massive. These are not included with Ableton Live. You will have to purchase these from their websites and not through Ableton Live, unfortunately. So the clip view, let's just open a few audio tracks. So Command T, Command T, we've got some audio tracks. So now we have two MIDI tracks two audio tracks. So I'm going to open a project I was using previously and I'll show you just some of the stuff I did there. So I just quickly threw this together, I just want to show you how the session view actually works because it is really important. A lot of people when they're new to Ableton Live can get confused by the session view because the arrangement view, it looks like a lot of other digital audio workstations but this session view can look very different. So if you click on this here, so this is a synthesizer, and after the synthesizer, which processes this MIDI information into audio information, we have an EQ, an equalizer. So let's just play this loop. We can click on any of these little clips here by pressing this arrow button. And if we press one of these squares here, it will stop the clip. Or we can press the square down here, which will stop all of the clips going down. We can also play the clips horizontally by hitting this little play button here. So this will play all of these clips here. You can drag and move these around. So if I press this little play button here, this will play this bass clip and it will play this drum kit. You can also stop the clips by pressing the space bar. You'll notice they're still lit up, these clips. If I press the space bar again, it will play the clips again. If we go down, we can stop all of the clips by hitting this square button in the bottom right. And now when I press spacebar, nothing is playing. You can go through and trigger different clips together. So you could play that one, stop this one, play this one, stop this one, stop this one. So I'm just going through it and playing through. So on the fly, if you have a lot of different clips, you can just quickly make loads of music. So what I'm going to do now is just hold down Alt like other applications on Mac. And I'm just going to drag this over and I'm just going to go through and go into this MIDI editor, which you can actually drag to make bigger. So I'm just going to go through and just delete the second half. So all I did is just drag over and delete. So now this is actually a different kind of clip. You can right click and color this different, just so I know it's a different kind of clip. Same with this piano sound. I'm going to hit Option or Alt, right click, let's color this different. And then I'm just going to change this a bit. I'm just going to copy this MIDI information, just so it's a bit different. This is just an example how you can quickly throw some clips together. Same with these drums here. I'm just going to uh, double click on this. Just going to get rid of all these percussion parts, apart from that one. And then I'm just going to uh, right click that. Let's make that different colors to the rest, so let's choose, say, this one. Okay, this is just a really quick way of creating an arrangement in the session view. I do recommend spending a lot more time than this. However, for example's sake, let's just go through and make a quick arrangement in the session view. So what I'm doing now is just dragging these parts down. OK, 
Okay. This is in real time as well. And then you can play these different rows. You can play these horizontal parts. So all of these parts here, all at the same time, scroll along if there's any more, by hitting this button here, this little play button. So I'm going to play this now. And notice it's just playing the drums. So next it will play the different drum kit. So this one has some different information to this one. We can click on the clips just to see the information. And let's play this with the play button and it should hopefully bring in this straight EP, this piano sound, electric piano, and this plastic vibraphone synthesizer sound. And let's continue with this. We could even go through and just click certain ones we want to change like this in real time. So we can click these parts individually by going through and clicking them, or we can click on the horizontal rows over here. And we can hit stop by hitting the space bar or stopping all clips down here or stopping doing individual instruments by hitting the square button. So that's really how you can quickly go in and start making music. And what we're going to look at later on is we can actually record this performance. So what I did that, I played the different clips I made a bit of a performance. We can record this into the arrangement view and then we can go through and fine tune some of these instruments. So we could add some effects, we could change a few things around, we can mix it, we can make it more of a track. And that's the great thing about Ableton Live. I thought I'd show you this lecture quickly just so you know what's exactly going on in Ableton Live because that's one of the most amazing things about live is you have this session view here and you can just quickly throw in music. It's absolutely fantastic. So going along down here in the session view, you'll notice we have a few other things. Like I said, it's similar to a mixer. You have monitor here. So obviously you can hear me speak now. You can turn monitor off. You have the audio from. So you can see here the microphone is coming through here. And then we have master, audio to master. So all the audio it can get sent from one track to another one, but in the end it will all get sent to this master track. So this master track has all the audio from the different tracks. And then we have stuff like sends, so we can send reverb and different effects through these, which we will be looking at later on. Then we have a pan knob to make the audio go left and right, track activator, or we can mute the track so we can turn the track on or off. We can uh, arm the track, so we can make it record ready by hitting these little red buttons. We can solo the tracks. We have the track meter here, so you can see the level coming through. So for example here, you can see the level coming through. We have a few other things in this window as well. We have little arrows as well. So if we click this little arrow in the top left, you'll notice this browser section's actually gone. We can bring it back by hitting this little arrow. Down here, this is very useful if you're new to Ableton Live. We have the info view. So if you hover over, say, this here, you'll notice it will say track pan in the bottom left. Adjust the track's position in the stereo field by clicking here and dragging up or down. Let's hover over here where it says sounds. Browser sounds. Click here to view all of your instrument racks and instrument presets organized by the types of sound they make. So it basically just tells you what's going on, which can be really, really useful. We can hide this all as well by hitting the arrow. But I do recommend if you're new to Ableton Live, just leave this open the whole time until you know what stuff actually does. We have another arrow as well down here. So you notice this will show and hide this editor as well. So this is for editing MIDI and this is for editing audio. So you can click this and this to hide that, open up a bit more space. So if you're doing a live performance, for example, you might want to have a lot more space available so you could hide all of these different triangles on the side. You can bring them back here as well. So here we have stuff like the tempo and the meter of the track, the time signatures, the metronome, in the next lecture, we're going to navigate around Ableton Live in a bit more detail. So I'll show you what all these things actually do above here. And yeah, I thought I'd just show you this lecture so you can quickly just start going in the session view, messing around, finding sounds, finding samples, finding presets, and just going in and just experimenting and making music. In the next lecture, we're going to navigate in a bit more detail Ableton Live and then in a future lecture, we're also going to have a look at this browser section here. So if you want to know about this in more detail, I recommend having a look at the browser lecture. 
I recommend going into Ableton Live now, experimenting with the session view, just start making some music, start making some beats, just clicking on stuff, seeing what stuff does, and then coming back to these lectures and having a look in more detail what some of the stuff actually does. So thank you for watching this lecture, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so going along up here, we have the control bar. This has things like the tempo, the tap tempo. We can choose the time signature, the metronome. We also have our quantization here. Then going across, we have the arrangement position. And then we have the transport control. So play, stop, record. So going along, we have some of the overdubbing features. And then we have some controls for mapping keyboard, MIDI mapping, and then we have some system performance indicators like the CPU, and also if there's MIDI information coming in from external MIDI devices. We're going to go through more of these when we need them because if you're new to Ableton Live and explaining exactly what some of these things do, it's not really in context. So the best thing to do is carry on through these lectures and when we go in and start making music and explain what the instruments do, what the audio effects do, what the MIDI effects do, Max for Live, the plugins, the clips, the samples, the places, when we go through all of this, it will make a lot more sense. But I don't really want to go through some of these over technical things to start with. I want you to go in and start making music, start experimenting, having a look at this session view, having a look at the arrangement view, just start putting in beats, start putting in ideas, start getting loops. And then we explain in detail how you can use more of these features in Ableton Live. But the most important thing is to just start. So I recommend just going to Ableton Live now and just start playing with some ideas. The next lecture, we're going to have a look at this browser feature over here. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hi and welcome to this lecture where we're going to be looking at the browser. The browser is this section over here. You can open and close it with this little triangle. It allows you just to go in and choose instruments, sounds, effects, that kind of thing. We also have this feature here, favorites, so we can save your favorites. And let's just go down, we have sounds. So this has some of our presets. Of course, we can just click on these to audition them. Just make sure this headphone is actually toggled on, this blue little headphone. And then you can just audition these, hear what they sound like. You can double click to insert this in, but what this will actually do is it'll replace the instruments in your MIDI track. So before I did have a drum kit, now it's playing this ambient swell. So if you hit Command and Z, it'll bring it back. So what you can do is drag it onto a new MIDI track. And if there's not a new MIDI track, I recommend creating a new MIDI track, Shift Command T, shortcut, or going to Create up here, insert MIDI track. You can just drag these over to the MIDI tracks. There you go. And now we have this ambient swell. And we can expand this by hitting this little arrow here. You notice it hasn't actually dragged in any clips. It's just brought in this instrument because you will have to actually add your own clips. So remember, if you double click on this MIDI information here, you'll get this uh, MIDI note editor. If you hit the B button, you can draw in some notes. If you hit the B button again, it'll get rid of this little pencil. You can hear these notes if this headphone icon is toggled on. Backspace to delete. Okay, I'm going quite fast, but I do want to kind of get through the essential setup in Ableton Live, because the most fun part really is going in and learning what the synths do, learning what the effects do, and actually make music. But at the same time, this stuff is important because if you don't know how to use this, it will hinder your performance in actually creating music, in actually making sounds or live performance in Ableton Live. So the sounds will give you a load of different sounds. You can just quickly go in and find some sounds. So say you're after a piano sound, you can go down and find piano and keys. Then you can just have a look here, and abstract piano, Go down Grand Piano, Grand Piano Pad, or you can go to the search engine here, let's type in Piano, and in Sounds, it'll bring up all the different piano sounds. Okay, and then going down, we have drums. Of course, this will have drums. This will actually have different drum kits. This won't actually drag in these samples here. So if we drag this over to this MIDI instrument again, 
can take a moment or two to load. And you'll notice it's not actually playing the drum kit. The preview will give you a drum beat. However, you will have to program your own drum beat in, in this drum section. This is for drum kit, so you can go through, audition some of these. Say this one was quite nice, say like this. You can drag this in, and this will give you something called a drum rack. I do recommend checking out the lectures on the drum rack. I'm not going to explain that now because it is quite in depth. There's a lot of different functions and features in the drum rack and I have several lectures just on the drum rack. So I recommend if you want to have a look at creating your own racks, so creating basically a drum kit with different sounds inside one MIDI instrument, definitely check out the drum rack section. Okay, so we have drum hits, bell, congo, bongo, claps, loads of stuff going down, there's tons of them in Ableton Live Suite. And instruments, we have the different instruments as well. We've got a lecture about these, so if you want to have a look at, say, this wavetable, which is brand new to Ableton Live 10, have a look at the wavetable lectures. But we can go in and just drag some of these presets. Like before, we can just click on these to preview them. Just make sure this little headphone icon is on. This is really useful, because you can just quickly hear what type of sound you're going to get, and if you do like this, drag it over like before, and then you will have to go in and add some MIDI information. Some of this can be quite daunting, but remember, have a look at the lectures on this section about Wavetable and the other synthesizers. So we've got loads of different ones here, loads to choose from. Then we have audio effects, this is stuff like EQ, compression, reverb, that kind of thing. There's loads of lectures about this in the course as well. So I'm not going to go through all of these now because there's a lot here and it's quite a detailed thing. And then we have MIDI effects. This is stuff like arpeggiators. And the difference between audio effects and MIDI effects is the audio effects processes the audio. So this is after it's gone through the instrument. The MIDI effects is before it goes to the instrument. So a MIDI effect like an arpeggiator will go here before the instrument. And an audio effect like a chorus will go here after the instrument. So I'm just going to uh, drag this down, turn this monitor to auto, and you'll notice when I play a key, you have some of this, these dots here. So this is MIDI information that gets processed into this arpeggiator. You can hear a different rate of the arpeggiator. Then it goes into this instrument that processes and changes this MIDI information into audio. And you'll see here, we get some audio and then it goes into this effect, which is a chorus. So you can obviously change some of these features for the chorus. But that's just a quick overview of the difference between MIDI effects and audio effects. There's a lot of different ones in Ableton Live Suite. If you're using a different version of Ableton Live, like Ableton Live Standard or Ableton Live Intro, you might not have as many instruments, audio effects, or MIDI effects. And then going down, we have Max for Live. Max for Live is very detailed. It's basically a way of actually programming your own sounds. We will look at that later on in the course. So if you want to have a look at Max for Live, check that out. Then we have plugins. So this is for third party plugins. So companies like Native Instruments, Waves, UAD, that kind of thing. They will be in here. If you have a Mac, you have audio units and VSTs. If you're using a PC to use Ableton Live, you will just have VSTs. So none of these will actually come with Ableton Live, so I'm not really going to go through these in this course because there's so many different ones, and that's for a different class altogether, that's for a different course. But if you do want to use any external instruments, like I use the keyboard Serum quite a lot, it will be under either VSTs or audio units. But the instruments and the effects you get in Ableton Live are more than good enough to make very decent music. Of course, you can get other external instruments, other external plugins, but generally they will cost money. There are a few free plugins you can get online, but the good ones normally you will have to pay for. Okay, and going down we have clips. So this will play different clips, so different loops. You will have to go down here and click to preview. So we get stuff like percussion, this one here, a weird drum sample, get some interesting stuff. And of course we can search up here, let's search for pop. So here we get drums pop, let's hear this. click again for it to start. Okay, and then you have samples, so this can be one shots, this can be like drum hits, snares, kick drums, that kind of thing, can be sound effects, crashes, there's some loops as well. So if you want to build your own sounds, if you want to do some sampling, 
these samples can be very useful. And then going down we have places, so we have packs. So these are some packs that are available at Ableton. So you might not have these straight away, you might have to go in and download some of these packs. Then you have user library as well, so these are some uh, racks and instruments that I've edited and created myself. So when you do create your own presets, they will be saved here. Then you have current folder. So these are some of our folders as well, and we can add folders. So if you have loads of different sample packs and libraries, they can be in these folders here, and we can just simply create our own folder. So that's the browser feature in Ableton Live. Just remember, we have our favorites, which can be quite useful. So you can always save favorites. Then we have sounds. So you can quickly go in and find some sounds. Drums, so you can go in and find some drum sounds instruments these are very detailed we will be covering this later in the course audio effects again it's a lot of different ones here don't worry if you don't have Ableton Live Suite you'll still have a fair few of these audio effects and MIDI effects as well so this is like I said effects that go before it's processed into audio so this will process the MIDI information and Max for Live which is quite complex I wouldn't really look at Max for Live right now if you're brand new to Ableton Live if you're intermediate or advanced Max for Live can be fun and interesting because you can really go in and customize your own sounds then we have plugins which are from third-party manufacturers so companies that are not Ableton Live so other companies like I said, Waves, UAD, Native Instruments that kind of thing but you will have to buy them from their websites and install them and clips and then samples so thank you for watching this lecture just about the browse section and i'll see you in the next one hello and welcome to this lecture where we're going to deconstruct and analyze a track that i'm actually currently working on so we're going to start off with looking at the chord progression so in this track we've really got three different chord progressions we have this section here which is green this section here which is blue and then there's another section over here with another chord progression. So let's just have a look through some of these chord progressions and I'm going to explain how I actually wrote these chords. So first of all this is in the key of C minor but that doesn't necessarily mean all the chords have to be in C minor. I do throw in a D flat so this is a note that's not in the key of C minor so temporarily it does actually change to a different key and I like to do this sometimes because it can add a bit of flavour and a bit of movement to your chord progression. So let's just have a quick listen to the first section. So that's the first chord progression. This song has not been mixed yet. It's still the ideas there. And I thought I'd show you this while I'm still in the writing phase. So let's just have a look at some of these chords. So this first chord here is actually a C minor. We know it's a minor because we have the flattened third. If it was a major, it would be the sharpened third. And next we have an A flat. So we have the A flat, C, E flat and A flat again, an octave higher. In Ableton Live, it does come up as sharps instead of flats. I normally look at C minor in terms of flats rather than sharps. Okay, next we have quite a big chord here. So it's similar to the other one. We have a C, an E flat, a G, and a B flat. So this chord I actually played by ear. So it's quite an unusual one. It's kind of a, an A flat with a G in the bass. But we do have the seventh of an A flat and we also have the second of an A flat, which is a B flat. So it's kind of a um, A flat seven add two over G because we have the G in the bass. So it's quite a big kind of in-depth chord. Let's have a listen to this in a different part of the song as well. So it's this chord here. Can add quite a bit of richness to the track. Let's just solo this main pad. Here. So it does add a bit of tension as well, these, this chord. And we do release it in the next chord, which is simply just an F minor. 
So the F minor has an F, a C, an F again, and then the flattened third, which is the difference between a major and a minor in most cases. So we have this C minor, then we have the A flat, then we build a bit of tension with this third chord, which is a kind of an A flat 7 add 2 over G, quite a complex chord, and then we release it again with this F minor. Then we go back to the C minor, and then we have another interesting chord. It's quite a simple chord, it doesn't actually fit in the key, this is a uh, D flat major. So we have the D flat, because in the key signature of C minor, there isn't a D flat. So this creates a bit of movement as well, because it has this kind of semitonal shift. And then we release it again with the F minor. Okay, and then we have the last chord, which is basically a G minor, with a lot of space. So this chord progression is really about tension and release. I want to create a nice chord progression, but now and again, I want to add a bit of tension and then release. So we can do this by building up kind of larger, more unusual chords that can add tension, or we can actually do this by creating a uh, modulation, so we're moving to a different key, and then we release back to the key. So that's what, really what the first chord progression is about, just creating tension and release to make the song, in my opinion, sound a bit more exciting. Then we have the second section, which is kind of the verse, and this just repeats the first two chords. So you can see here we have the loop of all the chord progressions, and this just repeats the C minor and the uh, A flat. So it's just a simple two chord progression, just because I don't want all this tension all the time. For the intros and kind of the chorus section, we have this more complex chord progression, but for the verse, it's just these two chords. So when it does bring in this more interesting chord progression, it makes it stand out a bit more. And then we have this middle eight section, so we have another section of chords. So this has a lot more space, you can see the chords aren't as full, so it creates a more open sound. So here we have C minor, then we go to a G minor, and then we go to a F minor, then we go to a kind of a G minor again, then a C minor. And then the F minor. So that's this chord progression. It's not really too much about the exact notes you use. I do recommend playing by ear, as well as knowing your music theory. But just remember, if you want to make your music more exciting, you can add suspense, you can add tension by adding some unusual chords in there. As long as you get the loop going round, so the loops match the first chord and the last chord or match each other. In between, you can add stuff that's a bit more exciting. You can add stuff that doesn't necessarily fit in key just to make it sound more exciting. So that was really the premise I had when I was creating this song. I wanted to make a chord progression that added tension, that added suspense, and then got released. And that's really how I did it with this main chord progression here. And then I just looped the first two chords. Then I had a more open section with less bulk going on in the chords as kind of a middle eight section just to add a new element into the track. So that's really the chord progression for this track. In the next lecture, we're going to continue looking and analysing this song. Now let's have a look at the melodies of this track. So the melody of this track is based on this main riff here, and then we have a few alterations of this riff. Let's just hear this. That's the main melody. It's really just based around the chord progression. In the previous lecture, we had a look at the chord progression. It wasn't a standard kind of uh, two, five, one chord progression. So we don't use the standard notes and the standard chords you might find in regular chord progressions. There is a modulation in there. There is a few notes that don't necessarily fit in key, but that's fine. It doesn't have to fit in key. So let's have a look at this melody here. The good thing about Ableton Live is when it's one note at a time, it will tell you what the notes actually are. So the first chord we had was a C minor. So we have a G, which is the fifth of C minor, and 
we have a B flat or an A sharp, which is the seventh. Then we have the G sharp or A flat, which is the sixth. And then going down, we have the F. So it's basically just notes that fit in the chord. And I actually played this on a MIDI keyboard. And I just wanted to have something with some long held notes with some runs in between. So we have the two main notes here. And this is really just the runs in between that fit in key. And that's really what I did, continuing on. Continuing on into the next chorus, I just held the other notes as well. And it's a similar kind of thing all the way through, it's just the held notes. There is one section, however, where I do actually play a D flat. moment this is just the notes in the key. So this is really just built around notes in the chord. Normally built around the root, the third and the fifth and then in between I have a few different runs that still fit with the chord. And when we modulate to the chord that doesn't actually fit in key, I change the melody so that fits with that chord as well. So that's the main melody. It's just really built around some long held notes that are normally the triad, so the root, the third, or the fifth of the chord, sometimes the seventh. And then I just put some passing notes in between. I try and make it sound melodic. I try and make it sound like it's a song riff. It's something that can be quite catchy, but at the same time, not too predictable. Then we have this other riff here, which is built around the first two chords, which is a C minor and an A flat. So we have a similar kind of riff, but I just make sure when the chords actually change, the melodies and the riffs actually fit in these chords as well. So it's very similar. I just make sure when the notes change, the melody changes with the notes. Because you'll notice here the second half isn't actually here. I'm just using the first half of the riff. And I'm just double checking and making sure all the notes fit, which they do. So you can see here it finishes on a C. And if we play the note here, it also finishes on a C. So it's just the first half and I just went through and double checked via ear and through music theory that the notes actually fit. Then the rest of the melodies are basically just notes that are held or rhythms or patterns that just go around the root, the third and the fifth or sometimes the seventh of the chord. And a lot of it's just playing by ear and just knowing music theory. You need to know the chords really, you need to know chord progressions and you need to know your keys, especially before you try and think outside the box and create modulations and change the different keys. It is important to know your music theory. So I do recommend studying music theory, having a look at different chords, having a look at chord progressions before you go in and write music because it can help. Of course your ear is the most important thing but no music theory can definitely help. So that's the song analysis. It's basically built around this chord progression and then it's built around this melody. Okay, now let's have a look at another track that I'm currently working on. And let's have a look at the drum beat now. So I'm just going to play this track. And this drum beat was actually created with the drum rack on the push two. But this can be done without the push two, just by typing in notes as well. there's quite a straight drum beat. You notice we have the, the first section we have the kicks on every beat and the snares on beat three. And then we have this rhythmical hi-hat that does repeat quite a few times to create that kind of shaker feel. Thank you. 
And then the second part, it seems to add a bit more movement. And the reason it does this is mainly because the snares appear now on two and four. And we just have the hats on 16th notes. So there's less emphasis on the hats and more emphasis on the snare and the kick. And this adds a bit more movement. It's very popular in a lot of electronic music or disco music. We have this standard drum beat. And then the next section that we actually take out the snare. So it'll take away some of that movement. And then this time we bring the snare back in but it's not as frequent and we actually take out the kick to create less movement. And then we add this kick on the ends just to give it a bit more movement but it's not straight so it won't create as much drive. So this is perfect for more of a verse section but generally if you want more of a hands in the air, big chorus, straight kicks and snares on two and four we'll create this. And that's basically the drums. It's just around creating movement. And the easiest way of doing that is the positions of the snare. There's another section as well where I take out all the hats and there's even less kicks. And I've only got the snares on beat three. So when the snares are on beat three, it creates that kind of half time feel. And then we bring the kicks back onto every single beat, which creates more movement, and then it kicks back into this full section. And then we have the full section again, snares on two and four. So what I mean by two and four is there's four beats in the bar because we're in four, four. So one, two, three, four. So snares on four, the snares on two, the kicks on every beat. So this track is really built around the drums, it's built around creating movement and the way we can do that is by creating a straight drum beat, so we have the kicks on every single beat, the snares on beat 2 and 4 and then we fluctuate between that and a less straight beat. So a less straight beat will not be like this, it will not have the kicks on every bar, it will be uh, more like this, so there's some gaps, there's some spaces and that way when the straight beat comes in it's more noticeable and that kind of uh, directs the audience to believe that this is the chorus, this is the main section. So that's the drum beat. I actually wrote this on the push too, but you can use this in the piano roll editor. But I do definitely recommend using the drum rack if you want to create your own drums. Have a look at the section all about the drum rack if you don't know about that yet. That's one of my favourite features about Ableton Live. So thank you for watching this lecture, just about deconstructing one of my songs and the drum beats. Okay, now let's analyse another track. And the way I created this track is I wrote a load of clips in the session view and then I recorded it into the arrangement view. This track I'm currently working on and it does use some quite unusual chords. Some of the chords I can't describe because they're so unusual. There is a lot of modulation, there is a lot of key change, all about suspense and I wanted to create something quite eerie and quite mysterious. So let's have a listen to this. So it's quite an unusual chord progression. So if we have a look at the chord progression, let's just open this up. You'll notice we have this C playing all the way through, apart from the end where it goes down to an A flat. So I'm just going through each note, arpeggiating each note of the chord. This is quite an unusual chord. It's kind of a C major, 
then we have the minor 7th, so it's really a C dominant 7th. And then we have another chord here, which looks quite unusual. So we have an E, a B, and a C sharp, a D sharp, and a G sharp, so it's quite an unusual chord. This, we have a lot of suspense. Then we have a similar chord to the start. This time we drop, but we have a semitonal movement of the A sharp to an A. Then we continue through the chords, some more suspense, especially this bit here. We have a semitonal thing here. Generally, when you're writing music, if you add a lot of semitones, it can create a lot of suspense because this does really clash. So it's all about more of a regular chord and then suspense, more of a regular chord, suspense more of a regular chord, but we still have suspense in this semitonal movement here. So it's just kind of creating suspense and releases, especially these semitonal movements here, can create a lot of suspense. So it can sound quite eerie, quite mysterious, quite spooky, uh, which is really what I wanted to create. So let's just solo this piano part and have a listen to this again. It's a very unusual chord progression. I played a lot of this by ear on my MIDI keyboard. And I do use string sounds and piano sounds from a sampler called Contact. This is not included with Ableton Live. This is made by Native Instruments. But I do recommend it if you want some high quality samples. And then we have this string sound here. It's actually a violin sound which is playing a semitonal movement between C and B, just to add even more suspense and make this chord sound even more unusual. Let's just listen to the chords with this string sample as well. So this track is just really about creating suspense and the way I did this is by creating a lot of tension and also releasing and using semitonal movements so going between notes right next to each other to create that kind of eerie uncomfortable sound which is very popular in a lot of horror music, it's very popular in a lot of film music when people want to use suspense. So this is really an interlude track between my other songs just to add some uncomfortable tension between the more conventional tracks. So thank you for watching this lecture, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so we've gone over the basics of Ableton Live 10, such as setting up and recording. We've also had a look at some of the tracks that I'm currently working on. The next few lectures, we're going to have a look at some of the updates for Live 10, including the Wavetable Synthesizer and the Capture feature. If you'd like to continue learning with me after this video course, be sure to check out my complete Ableton Live 10 course. Like I said, with the coupon below, you can get this for only $10. Also, over at digitalmusicmasters.com, we do offer an academy and a mentorship program if you'd like to take your learning even further. So let's continue with the next few videos, where we're going to be looking at the updates for Ableton Live 10. Hello, in this video we're going to be looking at the Wavetable synth in Ableton Live 10. So this is brand new to Live 10. Live 9 we didn't have this synth. It's a Wavetable synth so we can actually control the synth a lot more with the Wavetable. It's similar to say Serum if you used Serum before. But if you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to just show you in this lecture how you can actually use this Wavetable synth. So I've just drawn in some chords here, just some basic chords and then I've opened up the Wavetable synth. So here we go. We basically have a couple of oscillators going through a couple of filters and then being modulated by a couple of envelopes and some LFOs. At first this can look quite intimidating, especially when you click on the matrix. It can be like, what is going on? But I'm going to go through step by step how you can actually use this synth. So let's go through on the left, we have a sub. 
So this is a sub octave below. We can control the gain, we can control the tone, we can control the octave. Without the sub. Controlling the tone. We can transpose it if we want. So now we're going to turn the sub off, but that's basically the sub, it's just a sub oscillator. So you can control the gain, the tone, get some nice interesting sounds with the tone. So with this basic sine wave over here, we am sure use this sound, we can go through the different types of wave. So we have a sine wave, triangle, square and sawtooth, the basic four waves. And this dial here just allows us to go between these different ones. So I recommend just going through and experimenting. This can produce a lot of gain. So I'd actually turn this down quite a bit on live. This is under the category basics. We have several different ones, collection, complex, distortion, filter, etc. Then we have basic shapes, and there's loads of different ones we can actually go through. So we can click through and choose different shapes, or we can just use this arrow here, and you'll notice straight away that there are a lot more waves, and it looks a lot more complex. So we can get a kind of more complex sound from this. So this is under the harmonic series. You notice here it changes from kind of a sine wave more of a square wave. And we have a different view here. So we have the more list style view of the waves changing or we have the circular view. There is no other stock synth in Ableton Live 10 that's really anything like this. This means instead of a simple periodic waveform, like I said before, sine, triangle, square, and saw, we have a whole collection of tables, and this is why it's called wavetable. Tables are combinations of different waveforms that can really just morph through the sound. It also has a global waveform morph control, which is this over here. I recommend just going through and experimenting to start off with. If you haven't used a wavetable synth before, it's so much fun. Just experiment and go through all the different sounds and try and hear the different wave sounds. So there really is a whole variety of different wave sounds here. First of all, it's just go through and experiment. Retro, for example, choose this one. Quite a simple one. So when you actually move this morph control, you're recalculating the waveform as it's being generated. You can also grab on our filter, so I'm just going to play this now, we change the frequency, we'll cut out a lot of the highs because this is a low pass, which means it allows the lows and cuts the highs. Change the resonance, which adds a bit of a peak at the cutoff point, add a bit of a boost at the cutoff. I generally like to get the synth sounding good before I add filters and effects, but you can always add the filter. Filter is a great effect, it's a great way to cut out some of these high sounds or maybe low sounds, sculpt the sound into something more that you're after. And of course we do have another filter as well, we have different types here. Let's change this to a High pass. So what a high pass does is it allows the highs and cuts the lows. So we're only really allowing this mid frequency of waves at the moment and sculpt it and change it around, but I'm just going to have the, the low pass for now. Okay, moving on. This is the bit that looks a bit more tricky. We have something called a matrix. So we can really go in and sculpt what's going on. So we have a matrix. This looks a bit more complex, but it gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of customization for our synth sound. 
We can really add some modulation with the LFOs, which stands for Low Frequency Oscillator. So we can basically make the sound go faster or slow in a really simple way of putting it. So let's change the oscillator one position. And here you can see the wave moving up and down through the LFO. We have a second LFO as well. Just double click to go back to zero. And if we go on the mod source, so modulation source, and we click on LFO, we can actually change the amount and the rate and the shape and the offsets. I generally like to sync this to the clock of the project rather than time amount, rather than one hertz. So I'm going to click on this little picture of a note here, and then we can just really sync it to a time value. Let's choose one eighth. Keep it simple. And then now 100% shape, so we can choose the different types of waves. Let's just choose a sine wave to start with and then go back to matrix and you'll notice now it's actually locked to one eighth. So if we turn on the metronome up here and then we add some LFO, you can hear it syncs up to the clock of the tempo. You can add modulation onto another one, say amp. So this is the overall volume really. It's going to be adding a low frequency oscillator. Of course, we can go back to Mod Sources and click on LFO2. This doesn't have to be the same rate. Let's change this to one six notes. Then go back to Matrix and then we can add on LFO2. So this is changing the oscillator one position. So this is changing the position of the wave. Let's change this to Amp as well. You'll notice it's creating something a little bit more unique now. So we have LFO going on one eighth notes and also LFO going on one sixth notes. So you can create something quite interesting. Double click to go back. Same with the pitch. Be careful of the pitch because it can sound maybe a little too wacky. But it depends what sound you're after. If you want a crazy kind of intro or some weird sound effects, you could add a low frequency oscillator onto the pitch. But my favourite one here is actually the oscillator one position. So you can go through the position of the waves at a certain rate, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so that's the basics of the wavetable synth. I recommend just going in now and playing around with the different oscillators. So we have the sub oscillator, oscillator one. We haven't really looked at oscillator two yet. We have the filter. We've started to look at mod source and matrix. In the next lecture, we're going to dig even deeper and look at the wavetable synth in more detail. So thank you for watching this lecture and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, let's continue looking at the wavetable synthesizer in Ableton Live 10. So one thing I didn't mention in the last video is if you hit this arrow here, it will expand the wavetable synth. You can even drag up more. And depending on your screen size, the zoom you have in Ableton Live will fill up different spaces. But if we drag it all the way up like this, you'll notice there's a lot more we can actually see in this wavetable synth. And before we had different tabs, so we had the MIDI matrix and we had the modulation matrix. Now it's put it all in the same tab. We have the filter here. And then we have oscillator one up here and oscillator two. We have the LFO here, so we can control the amount of LFO. Notice the waves get larger or smaller, the rate as well. So we get tighter as the rate increases. We have the shape as well make it more square or more triangle and then the offset as well. LFO2 is the same as LFO1 but you can have different low frequency oscillators going on at the same time if you wish. We have the amp here so this will affect the overall sound of the synth. Then we have envelope 1 and 2 which we can use in this modulation matrix as well as the amp. So the amp will affect the overall sound and then we can affect the separate envelopes 
with the matrix here. We can also affect the MIDI information, which is interesting too. And we do have a unison button here, so we can add unison. We have different types of unison, and we can add the number of voices as well. So let's choose classic. You'll notice when we play this back, we'll create a bigger spread sound. We can increase the amount. And that is none. So Unison obviously makes a huge difference. Okay, now let's add on Oscillator 2. Can actually control the gain levels of each oscillator here so we can create a balance. So let's choose, say, this one. We can also hit the arrow button and get the original synth that we had before. Let's go through these arrow buttons and let's go to the matrix and for oscillator 2 I'm going to add on some LFO. So let's turn off oscillator 1 and the sub. And turn on oscillator one and the sub. You can also change the synth to mono and add on glide. Obviously, this part is playing chords, so mono probably would not work. However, if you're creating more of a lead part, mono might be more useful, then you can get that interesting glide sound. And that's basically the wavetable synthesizer. One other thing we can do, which is really interesting, is we can actually right click and anything we want in here, any parameter, and go to show automation. Now we can actually add an automation. So let's go through this part here, and you'll notice that the filter will change. Increase it. So we can change the effects over time, which is really interesting as well. Another thing we can do is actually group this into an instrument rack. So if we just hit Command and G, we'll create an instrument rack. And then if we open up this, we can find a macro here. And then let's say we want. Let's just right click this and map this to macro one. And then when we move macro one, it will move the gain of oscillator two. And if you're using an external controller like an APC 40 or a push two, you can map this to these MIDI controllers also. So we could do a few other ones, let's say, Map the tone of the sub to macro 2. So you can see when we move the macro, it will move the other things here. You can also right click this and go to show automation. So we can actually automate the macro as well. Obviously, you can do this if you just automate straight away by right-clicking and hitting Show Automation. But a macro allows you to actually send several things there. So I'm going to map this resonance to Macro 2. So let's hear this back now. So you can actually see it moves in real time. And so does the macro. We can automate this macro here as well. So right-click show automation and let's create something a bit more extreme.
So we can see the macros moving, we can see the wave going through the waves, and we can see the filter and the resonance actually moving as well. So there's a lot of interesting things we can do, especially with the matrix, and especially when you start mapping this to an instrument rack and using these macros and using the automation. So I hope you found this useful. Remember, you can go into the wavetable and explore it even more by hitting this arrow. There's a lot of things to go through, but I do recommend mainly just going through and experimenting. There is stuff like the envelope we didn't cover so much, but it's a simple ADSR envelope. So you can change the attack time. You can hear now it takes longer for the attack to come in. We can increase the sustain. We can also use this in the matrix as well. The main thing is just to go through, explore, and just try and think of some interesting sounds. Of course, you can go to the instruments over here. So go to instruments, wavetable, and we do have a load of different presets. So what we can do is actually save this instrument rack here. So hit this save, I'm going to call it WT example. Now that's saved. And let's just open up a preset. So let's find, say, piano sitar. I presume this is a blend between the piano and the sitar. Let's hear this. So you can always go through and have a look at these presets and try and work out what it's doing. So you can go into the matrix, change some stuff around. and really just explore the presets as well. So that's basically how you can use this wavetable synthesizer in Ableton Live 10. I hope you found this lecture useful, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi, and welcome to this lecture, where we're going to be looking at the capture feature in Ableton Live 10. So if you have a track record enabled, so if you have this red button here, if this is selected on the track, you can actually capture stuff without recording it in. So sometimes you can come up with an idea when you're just messing around on say your MIDI keyboard or maybe even your push. You don't really have the pressure of recording then. Live can actually capture this MIDI information and tempo. So this can be really useful if you feel a bit of pressure recording or if you just want to mess around and get ideas, you can recapture these ideas again. Okay, let's use the capture feature. I'm just going to play around on my MIDI keyboard. Then all we need to do is hit this button up here, which is the capture button. There's the idea, it's changed the tempo as well. You can see it's changed to 78.5 beats per minute. We can also play in some overdubs. So I'm just going to play this part back now. So all I did is play in some ideas then and just hit the capture button. Okay, we can also add in, say, some drums. I'm just going to record, enable this drum kit. Then let's just play this keyboard loop again. We can also turn on the metronome if we wish. Like so, and then when we hit the capture button, drums will appear here as well. You notice we have a two bar loop in the first clip and Live wants to keep it as a two bar loop but we can rearrange this if we wish. Like so, we can also quantize this information now. We can hit Command A and Command U to quantize. So we can go back to the other one and quantize this if we wish also. And now when we play this back, we can turn off the metronome. We've just created the groove really quickly without even recording. So 
we can go in and edit parts, change stuff around. So we can just come up with initial ideas really quickly with this capture feature. And like I said, you can add on overdubs. What you need to do is hit the capture button again and you can see the overdubs have appeared. Like I said, we can quantize this as well. Now when we play this back, we just made a groove without really recording just by using the capture feature. So that's it, that's basically capture. So your loop and your tempo are captured. It allows you to focus on playing. Capture will allow you to record your loops, tempos, and it also records and captures the velocity of MIDI information. Then after you can edit this, you can quantize this, you can manipulate it. But just for coming up with initial ideas, capture can be really useful. All you really need to do is just make sure your track's enabled and select the capture button, which is this one here. And also, if you're playing your original clip, you can just quickly add in overdubs. So that's Capture, and that's how you can use it in Ableton Live 10. Hello, in this lecture, we're going to look at the echo audio effect. So this is a great emulation for analog delays, and it also can create some interesting noises. So this is it here. Let's just turn it on. And here we have a visual display of what's actually going on. And we have a few things around the edges. We have the rate. Then we have a reverb. And we have a few more tabs here, modulation and character. Okay, so I'm just going to play this little loop that I created without the echo on. And then we go through in detail what all these things actually do. So this is the loop that I just made. This is without the echo and with the echo. So let's go through these settings now. So here we have the sync rate for the left and the right channel. So we could choose, say, 1 64ths. It's quite a rubbery sound when it's that fast because it's so quick. We can slow it right down. And we have a link button here, so we could have the right having a different sync setting to the left, so let's try that now. And the visual display is actually showing us the speed here, so we have a lot more space here because the left is going at one half notes, and the right is going at one sixteenth notes, so we can actually see what's going on here, and if we link it, you can see it links together, and as we change it, the visual display will change with whatever we have changed on the left here. We don't have to have sync, we can have it time value. We could have the left with a time value and the right synced. At the moment, the dry wet is on 70%, if we put this to 100%. can also choose the type of note here as well. So we can have notes, triplets, dotted, sixteenth. And this is actually uh, faded out when it's in time value. This will only work in sync. So we could have, say, a dotted quarter note. And let's just link these. We could change this to a triplet.
but we can change it to 16. We can create some really crazy sounds when we move this in real time while the instrument's actually playing. Okay, so going down we have the input here. What we can do is crank the input up really far and then put the output down and this will create some uh, overdrive. I do recommend having a limiter on your output though if you're going to be doing stuff like this just in case you do push it too far. You don't want to blow your speakers. So this is one way of creating some overdrive if you want to get that really old-fashioned analog style echo. Let's just put this back. Double click to uh, go to default. Then we have this D button here. If we toggle this on, this causes the input gain to distort the drive signal. So similar kind of thing if you want a bit of overdrive or distortion. And below we have this little symbol. So this actually inverts the feedback polarity. We can increase feedback here. So the feedback will feed the echo back into the echo to create even more echo. We can get some really wild effects when we increase this feedback. Like I said, I do recommend having a limiter on the master channel if you are going to be playing with the feedback or pushing the echo quite hard. We actually have a filter here so we can filter out what we want to go to the echo. We can choose the filter high pass and the low pass and also the resonance of each one of these. And if we hit this little arrow button, we'll be able to just drag it around like so, which is a bit easier than just the numbers. So we can create kind of a band pass. So this is allowing the lows. Take out the lows. And obviously if we mix it with dry wet. It's only the frequencies here that are actually going to be put through the echo effect. Now it's just the really high frequencies that are going to be echoed. We could turn on or off the filter, this button here. Let's just put wet all the way up. Okay, we can hide the filter there. And going along we have reverb, so we can add reverb as well. And we can choose where we want the reverb. Pre means it will be before the echo. Post means after the echo and then feedback will be after the feedback as well. So post will be after the echo but before the feedback and feedback will be after all of it. So you can get some pretty crazy effects when you have the reverb on after the feedback. But let's hear the pre first. Let's try post. And let's try feedback. Then as we increase the feedback, some really wild sounds. turn the feedback down. So we can get some really interesting sounds or use this as a sound design tool as well. So going back to the time here we also have these offsets so we can create a bit of a swing delay if we create some offsets. So we just swing it a bit and won't make it exactly perfect. 
I do recommend having them both offset at the same points if you do want to get that swing delay. Okay, we also have decay for the reverb. So this is decay 100% and then all the way down. Okay, going up in the top right, we have stereo. Zero will actually be mono. And 100 will be its original width, and 200 is maximum widening. So if you want to create a bit of a wider sound, you could push it above 100. Then, of course, we have output, and we have dry, wet signal. We also have three different types of delay here as well. We have stereo, which is the one we're listening to. And we have ping pong, which goes from left to right. And then we have mid side. So the left becomes mid and the right becomes side. So this is the mid and this is the side. Ableton actually calls this display its echo tunnel and the distance between the lines is time and the density is the feedback. Okay, let's change this back to stereo and let's just link this and change it back to notes. Okay, now let's have a look at some of these things up here. We have modulation. So this section here allows you to delay time and filter frequency with the onboard LFO. So we can modulate the delay and the filter cutoff with LFO waves. So we have different ones to choose from. There's also even a noise one which can create some interesting sounds. So we can choose the rate of the LFO. Then we can choose the phase. So this alters the LFO's phase from the left to the right channels. Zero is in phase and 180 is perfectly out of phase. And then we can choose how much we want to actually modulate the delay by. And we can actually times this by four. We want a more extreme amount. So we can get some really crazy effects. We can turn off sync and choose a time base instead. And we can also modulate the filter cutoff. So we can get some really wacky effects with this modulation. And then we have envelope. So when we increase this envelope amount, this blends the LFO modulation with an envelope follower. So like I said, we can get some really wacky effects with this. And let's go along to character now, the third tab. So here we have four internal effects. We have gate, ducking, noise, and wobble. So gate, this will gate the signal. So this allows us to control what actually goes through our delay. So the parts have to reach the threshold to reach the delay. So you can determine what gets delayed or not. At zero, nothing's actually getting delayed. Nothing's going through this delay because nothing's hitting zero dB. If you lower this down to say four dB, 
a few parts, which sounds like maybe the snare is reaching 4 dB, and if we drop it even further, it's the whole of the drum kit. Let's just change some of this modulation. It's a little bit too crazy. Okay, and let's go back to the threshold, so up to zero. Nothing. If we go down. So 4.2, minus 4.2, that's right, it's the snare. Okay, and then we have release, which is how long it takes for the gate to close after the signal has dropped below the threshold. Going along, we have ducking. So ducking actually pulls down the wet signal when the input is triggered. So it's a bit like side chaining. We can get some nice rhythmic movements if we time this right. So let's have a listen to the ducking effect. Basically ducks it down. And then we have release, which is how long it takes for ducking to stop after the input signal drops below the threshold. Then we have noise. So noise dials in some noise to simulate a noisy analog delay. And you can morph between different types of noise with the morph here. And of course we can choose the amount. So this will create a more noisy delay, as you can hear. So if you want to replicate kind of an old-fashioned analog echo or delay, then this is quite useful with this noise here, as you can hear. It's still playing the noise. You can use this to create some sound effects as well, or for sound design. Okay, and then going along we have Wobble. So Wobble seems to randomly wobble the delay. So it's kind of a pitch wobbling effect. So we can choose the amount and Morph, and Morph will actually sweep between the different mod types, or the different modulation types. We can have more than one on as well. So we can create some really wild effects and not just use this as an echo or delay, we can actually use this as a sound design tool. Like I said, with the noise, you can create some interesting sounds just when it's noise. So that's it. That is the echo effect. Like I said, it's a lot of fun. You can create some really interesting sounds. I do recommend going in and playing with it. Start off with this, the main interface with the echo, then go through, add some LFO modulation, and then we can add some more effects with the character tab as well. So thank you for watching this lecture all about the echo audio effect in Ableton Live 10. Hi, in this lecture, we're going to have a look at the drum bus audio effect. So I've just got a drum track here, and let's just drag on a drum bus onto this drum track. Let's just hear what this sounds like without the drum bus, and then let's hear what it sounds like with the default drum bus. So here is the drum track, and here it is with the drum bus. You can hear straight away it gives it some body or punch. So the drum bus is meant to emulate an analog style drum processor. 
So it's designed really to add some warmth or some body to your drums. So we have a few different functions over here. I'm going to explain what all of these actually do. So the first one you'll notice is drive. So this quite simply will add some drive, so add some distortion or crunch to your drums. And then below this we have three different types of drive, soft, medium and hard. So let's hear what the three different types of drive actually sound like to this drum track. So this is soft, obviously if we increase the drive. Medium. And then hard. You can hear hard actually adds a lot of low end as well. So let's just get the EQ8 and just drag it on here as well. So this is hard, you can see there's a lot of low end. And if we swap it to soft. So this type of distortion or drive is called wave shaping distortion. It's called this because it will actually change the waves, it changes the shape of your sound. Okay, going down we have trim. So what this will do, this will allow us to trim the input. So if we don't want it to drive or push so hard, we can trim the input. So you'll notice we can't actually drag upwards, we can only drag down. So you notice it will obviously get quieter, we'll trim the gain. And if we double click, it will go back to zero. Then we have compressor. This is a very basic compressor, it's just a one button. So this is designed to give extra attack and give a bit more body to your drums too. And without compressor, you can hear instantly it gives that body and gives that depth to your drum sound. So going along we have crunch. This will add some more mids and highs to your drum sound. You can hear that crunchy sound on the snare. And below this we have damp. So what damp will do, it will take away some of the higher frequencies. So it's similar to a low pass filter for our distortion. So with the crunch, it can get a little bit too harsh with those mids and highs. So we can kind of filter out or damp out some of those highs with the damp. Obviously if we have it all the way here, it sounds quite muddy. We can find a nice sweet spot around about eight or so. So we can filter out some of these sounds that might be a little bit too harsh. Okay, going down we have transients. This is an interesting feature in the drum bus. So this allows you to actually emphasize the transients. So these are the initial hits of the drums. So they'll punch through your mix a little bit more. And if we move this to the left, this will actually take away the decay of the drums. So it makes everything sound a bit sharper or a bit snappier. If you compare this to in the middle. So a lot snappier drums really. And if we move this to the right it will still emphasize the transients. However we get a bit more body to our drums. So this is nice if you're using real drums that are recorded in a real sound and you want to add a bit of body. This transient feature is useful for this. So this compared to, so it can add a bit more body. Okay, going along, up at the top, we have boom. So when we turn on boom, we're actually adding musical notes to our drums. Obviously this is quite an extreme example because it's on 100%. We can actually choose the notes we want with frequency here. And you'll notice it will tell you the note with this button here. This might be a little bit too high for tuning drums. This can be useful for tuning your kick drum. You can see here it says E0 and if we click it, it will tune to E0. I'd normally tune to the key of your track, or maybe even the fifth. And if we click 
click this, this will tune to G0. Okay, we also have decay. This decay control will determine how long this bass note or boom note will actually last for. So if we have a short decay sound, the boom sound will not last very long. And if we have a longer decay sound, the boom sound will last a lot longer. We also have this little headphone icon. So this actually allows us to audition the actual bass frequencies here. So if we want to tune the bass frequencies or we want to hear the notes from this boom dial, just make sure you select this headphone icon and it will just isolate these. Okay, then we have a dry wet amount. So this might be useful if you want to get a blend between your dry signal and your wet signal. So your signal without the drum bus and with the drum bus. And then of course we have the output if you want to increase or decrease the output gain. So that's it, that's the drum bus. It's a useful tool for making your drums sound more powerful and have more warmth. And it also can give your drums that analog character. Okay, let's have a look at the pedal plugin. So this is basically a distortion device that's meant to emulate guitar pedals. There's a few different types of distortion, overdrive, distort, and fuzz. So the overdrive is sort of a light distortion, then distortion is more of a medium, and fuzz is more of a heavy distortion. As we turn up the gain as well, we can get some more distorted effects. So I've just created a loop here, let's just play this, and then we hit the difference with the pedal on. Okay, now let's turn the pedal on. So that's fuzz, you can hear straight away how distorted it actually is. Let's go to distortion. And then overdrive. So as we increase the gain, it will become more distorted. And fuzz is just quite out of control when you increase the gain. We have output as well because these distortion units can create a lot of output. I do also recommend having a limiter on your master channel because it can peak when you're using a lot of distortion and you don't really want to blow your speakers. So with a few other things as well, we have a bass, a mid and a treble EQ. And the mid has three settings, kind of a low mid, a middle mid, if that makes sense, and a high mid. So I do recommend going through them and just finding the sound that will suit what you're after. We also have a sub because sometimes when you distort you can lose some of the lower frequencies and the sub will just boost this. I do recommend having this on unless you have a bass sound and the frequencies are going to clash when the sub is on. But normally the distortion will sound a bit bigger and a bit beefier when you have the sub on. So with the sub and without the sub. You could also boost the bass here, if you want it even bass here. And of course, like most of Live's audio effects, we do have a dry wet amount. If you'd like to balance your dry signal, so the signal without the pedal, and the wet signal, the signal with the pedal. So you could have, say, a really crazy fuzz effect that's balanced with the dry signal. So just a small amount of the fuzz effect coming through, but it give that big distorted effect in the background. That's it. That's basically the pedal effect. You can get some really big beefy effects when you distort chords as well as the lead parts. And that's basically it. This pedal effect is meant to simulate a real stomp box, so an actual like, guitar pedal or a real analog pedal. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. 
Okay, now let's have a look at panning. So when we move things in a stereo field, this is panning really, so we can move things from the left to the right, and vice versa. So I've got a drum track here. We move it to the right, and we can move it to the left. What it's actually doing though is it's turning down the volume of things in the left channel when we go to the right, and it's turning down the right channel when we go to the left. We can create true stereo panning though, so what we need to do is actually right click our pan knob, and then click on select split stereo pan mode. So this allows us more control of panning, so we can move the left all the way to the right, and the right all the way to the left if we wish. Swap the panning around quickly if we put them both in the middle. It'll be C or center. And this will make the track mono. So this will actually lose our stereo field. So it's actually quite easy to invert the placement of your stereo tracks here. You can just put the left to the right, and then the right to the left. Or you can put them both to say the right, or both to the left. And we can right click and go back to stereo pan mode, which is the standard one, just this dial. If you do want a bit more control, I do recommend having a look at the split stereo pan mode. And we can use this for any of our tracks. It just gives us a bit more control than just one dial, which basically just reduces the left and the right channels, depending on where you put this knob. So that's it. That is the split stereo pan mode. Okay, in this lecture, we're going to look at multi-clip editing. In the past, we could only see one clip at a time, but now with Ableton Live 10, we can look at up to eight clips at the same time. So this can be useful for editing. So we know, for example, what chord's being played or what rhythm's being played. We can see the other clips all in the one editor window. So all you need to do is just select the clips. So on a Mac, just hold down Command or in the PC, hold down control and just click on these and you'll see the different lines actually appear. So let's just expand this out. If we go down, we can see what's selected here in green is the drum rack. And then if we select this line here, the next one, this is a synth part and above is another synth part. So when we play this loop now, we can see each individual clip. And the easiest way to go between them is to just select up here. So for example, we want to move apart, let's say this click here and then the snare. But then we also want to move this part here. We can do this quite easily now just in the same clip editor. So it makes it a lot easier to see what's actually going on in the other clips. It's really useful, especially for drums and basses, and also for lead instruments. So you could open up the clip with the chord, and then you could base the lead instrument or base the melody around the notes in the chord. So instead of flicking between clips, which you had to do in previous versions of Ableton Live, you can just have them all open and just see what's going on in the other clips to make something lock in rhythmically or lock in harmonically or melodically. We can also do this in the arrangement view as well. So I'm just going to copy these clips into the arrangement view. Just open up the clip editor by double clicking a clip and then hold down command to open the other clips. So you can see here by these three lines, there's three different clips. And when we scroll down, we'll be able to see the two different synth parts and the drum parts. Obviously the drums have stopped there because the drum clip was just four bars and the synth parts were eight bars. 
So that's it, that's how you can multi-edit clips. It's really straightforward, just remember to select them all and then go between them with these lines here. So viewing and editing more than one clip in the editor just allows you to see things without switching between. You can see the drum parts if you want to write a bass line or you can see the chords if you want to write a melody part. It just speeds things up and it makes it a lot more convenient when writing music in Ableton Live. Okay, we're at the end of this video course now. Thank you for sticking with me. If you found this course useful, remember to give me a thumbs up. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, just leave them in the description below. So this course you just watched was actually the first few sections from my complete Ableton Live 10 course. If you'd like to access this complete course where we go a lot deeper, we have a look at the instruments, the racks, the audio effects, the MIDI effects, and much more, then have a look at my complete Ableton Live 10 course, which is only $10 if you follow the link in the description below. Full price is $195. Also, if you'd like to continue learning with me, uh, I do offer an academy and a mentorship program over at digitalmusicmasters.com or just follow the link in the description below if you want to take your learning to the next level and have a more tailored approach to music production. So thank you for watching this video course. I hope you found it useful and I'll talk to you soon.